Service Subcommittee of the City Council meeting on March 9th at 6 p.m. Um, my name is Peter Tallman, the chairman. Uh, we have Will Puello, who is on the committee. He's on Zoom, and David Bartley, hopefully, will be joining us shortly. Uh, in, in chambers here is uh, Councillor Linda Vacan, who is uh, from Ward 5, and Councillor at Large, Joe McGivern. Also on Zoom, we have Councillor Juan Anderson Burgos and Councillor Jose Maldonado Velez. So uh, we'll open up the meeting. Um, Will, you're all set? Yeah, I'm good, sir. I'm here. I'm actually on my way over to the, to the city now, so I'll follow on through Zoom. I'm hands free. Okay, great. Okay, uh, item number one uh, from Mayor Joshua Garcia, letter appointing Stephen C. Fay, 218 Pleasant Street, to serve as commissioner to the local historic district commission, Fairfield Avenue. Mr. Fay will serve a three-year term. Said term will expire on July 1st, 2025. Mr. Fay, come on in. So grab a seat here and there's a button there uh, you can hit for the, um, for the mic, it's turned green. Got it? Got it. Super. Okay, as we usually do for uh, new appointments to the um, city council, we like to have people come in and um, just get to know you a little bit and talk about yourself and why you want to serve on this board. And I know that you're you're right in that area there, uh, Fairfield Avenue. I know the uh, the house there on Pleasant Street. So um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're willing to serve. Well, thank you. Um, my wife and I settled in Holyoke um, two and a half years ago. We came here from Maine where we had lived and worked for 23 years. Uh, I've been in the newspaper business pretty much all of my life at the Berkshire Eagle in, in Pittsfield, Brattleboro Reformer in Vermont, the Ellsworth American in Maine, and then uh, retired and uh, came here to be closer to my wife's sister who lives in Amherst. And um, we got a lovely house at, uh, as you know, on Pleasant Street. I'm an avid jogger and I was jogging Fairfield before I knew anything about it. I thought it was one of the prettiest streets in town. So I got to know the houses and uh, the neighborhood. And um, when Mayor Garcia asked if I would <coughs> consider being on the Historic District Commission, I was pleased to say yes. I appreciate that. Um, you know, this is a, a, a commission, uh, the Historic Commission has been on for a, uh, you know, been with us for a number of years. and. Um, uh, it's really, um, actually, you have the whole historic district there. I guess there's signs up there that we put up probably 10, 15 years ago um, yes. in that area. Um, and and it's important for, for members of the community to get involved in, in government. And, and, and even if it's a small role as a, you know, a, a commission like this. Um, but it, it shows that, um, you know, this is an all-inclusive government. We want to get people involved, citizens involved, especially new people that moved in. Um, you said you're from Maine. What, what part of Maine? Well, I'm actually from, uh, California. Oh, California. Okay. I'm from Berkeley, California. Oh, wow. Okay. Met a girl from New York when I was in college and ended up on the East Coast. Super. And uh, variously lived in uh, Great Barrington, Lenox, then Brattleboro, then Ellsworth, Maine, which is halfway between Bangor and Bar Harbor. Okay. And then down to Holyoke. So these are pretty exciting areas you've lived in over the years, and especially yeah. I'm familiar with uh, Linux and that area up there. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, any uh, questions from uh, from the committee or the uh, council? Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Stephen, welcome. I'd just like to say thank you for stepping forward, and uh, I think you'll uh, be a good fit for the, uh, for the local district uh, commission itself. It's uh, it, it says for every avenue, but they take on. I think I'm sure they told you they take on other uh, issues too. Sometimes throughout the city, which yes. is you know working out. Which we're trying to tweak it itself. I, I just no, note when you said Ellsworth, Maine. I have some family that somehow came into this country through Ellsworth uh, from uh, from Northern Ireland. And is that uh, so? I guess some. Um, I think there's a maybe a. A cemetery grave or two up there that connects back to the the McGivern family, but I know my dad did some research and was up there a couple of times, and he, he loved the area. He said it's beautiful up there. It is. But welcome to Hoyoke, and the nice thing about Hoyoke, even if you're only here for two years or 
one year or 62 years, you, you know, if you proclaim yourself a Hoyoker, you are a Hoyoker because this city, uh, city just loves people who care about us. Well, we feel the same way. It was immediate. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for stepping forward. Thank you. I also note that uh, Tessa Murphy Rambaletti is here also on Zoom. Any other counselors or any comments or questions? Councilor Puello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Faye. Sorry I'm a little late. Weather's ugly outside. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you more about the Historical Commission. I love history. I'm a big history buff, uh, especially about you know all the historical things here in Holyoke. I want to support it. I make sure we're doing right by you guys. So thanks for stepping up, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody on Zoom have any comments or any questions? Okay, no, nobody there. Um, like I make a motion, uh, ask for a motion to confirm the appointment. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you so much. Uh, we'll bring this forward, uh, Stephen, to the uh, full council next uh, Tuesday evening. And after that, they'll get in touch with you to, to take get you into involved in the meetings. Thank you. It's an so, honor. Okay, thank nice you so you. much. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Motion to take item two off the table. So moved. Uh, item two, I just want to hey. let, welcome uh, Councillor Jourdain just joined us here. Welcome, welcome Councillor. Yes. Item two, this is uh, an item ordered uh, by me. Um, ordered that the administrative assistant be invited to provide a quick tutorial during a public service meeting on council use of Google Drive folders for better understanding of use of electronic files of orders and meeting folders. This will be also will be an opportunity to provide public understanding of access to folders that will be made available to their access in the near future. Yeah, I think so. I can help you out with this, Pete. Okay, <laughs> it's Tessa good too. Jeffrey, uh, we're all set. Okay, so this is uh, going to kind of be in two distinct parts. So. The first is a little bit more uh, of a tutorial of when I send you, so when I send the notices to all of the counselors with all of the information for the meetings when they get scheduled, all of the orders and everything, I include a link to the uh, drive folder for the meeting. So let, I'm just gonna put up a screen share real quick. All right, so you can all see that on your screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, so I just, I used, since we're in the public service committee, I used uh, the public service. So what you see right there is the Google Drive for counselors. And so what I do is, as you can see, there's the folder for the jacket, and then each of the meetings has a folder, and I've got a folder for the previous term. So I open up, so what I do is when I send you out that email, what I, there's this Git link, and so what I'm doing is I'm copying this link and putting it into that email so that when you receive that email, you click on that link and you're able to access that folder. and very importantly, the setting that I have here, when any time I post these links is viewer, and that means that no editing can be done for this. And this is gonna be really important for when we start getting the uh, drive folders uh, up and posted for uh, the public's benefit. That way, you know, nobody's gonna be able to do any, make any changes to those, which is gonna be really important. So. I send you that link, you open the link, and it brings you here. And so what you can see is the, the agenda, and then I number label all of the items so that um, it's easy for you to see you know, when e each thing comes up, the order, and then if there are extra items going with the order. So you open it up and you've got it right there, or you can right-click it, and download it so that you can then open it full size and put it onto your own computer if you like. Um, double click it, it, comes up like that. So I um, suppose that's straightforward. So 
you know, go into the jacket and then all of your orders in the jacket are there. Now, specifically for the, the council jackets, uh, there's a folder for previous terms and I know a lot of you are working through clean, cleaning out jackets. So it might come to the point at some time when the previous term folder becomes obsolete, but uh, perhaps not because a lot of archive stuff gets put into those as well. Communications that stay with the committee for you know years for reference later on. So um, that's that. The other part I want to show is um, going to be more for the benefit of the public when I finally start getting the uh, folders posted. And my intent is that these are going to be a link that are going to be on the main page for each uh, committee. So I'll, uh, I'll take us there right now just to show you what I mean. So departments, city council, city council committees. And then, so my intent would be that on ordinance, you've got the meeting archive, committee members, the video of the most recent meeting. Let's see, you have to update that. And right under where it says meeting archive is where I'll have a button for the committee's jacket. And so the committee, uh, the member of the public will be able to click on that and you know, see what orders are in there. So I'm using the charter and rules jacket. And as you can see, I've labeled this council of orders for public just to kind of make the distinction for myself. So the charter and rules, I'm, I'm using this because this one's pretty much ready to go because it was kind of the most straightforward and um, uh, Chairman Maldonado Velez has been really working on getting through those. Uh, some of the others have a great deal more in the jackets to work through, so um, they're not quite ready. So uh, I mentioned when, or I mentioned to President McGee recently that um, when he made the mention that I was going to be putting this, part of this is going to be making notations. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'll bring up this first order here. You've got the order, as you can see, that's when it was filed. And there's this little highlighted section right here. And so you click on that and it brings up the little box on the right, tells you when it was tabled and you know if it's possible, I will try to add little notations in there as far as why it was tabled, what the purpose of it still being in there, what updates are there. You know, if there are items that are public hearing items, ordinance, DGR, um, I'll add the notation there as far as when it's being continued to. And, you know, it, once this gets up, you might see some of them that have several of these little comments on there, you know, tabled this date, tabled again, this date, tabled again. And, you know, as much as possible, I'll try to include you know, the reason for it, what the purpose for the committee continuing to hold on to it. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell what I'm planning to do and I'm certainly open to questions from any members of the committee or council. Thank you Jeff that's uh, pretty enlightening it looks like it's pretty basic I, I some of us are just afraid that you know, getting used to uh, this technology but it's basically all the orders in there for like tonight's meeting that you put out on paper we just get up on our computer our phone and we can keep that with us you know during the meeting or at a, at a council meeting to make it uh, you know, like you said, uh, a lot easier um, to grab uh, hold of. So um, I appreciate that. It's going to take a little bit of time for me. I'm a little bit slow on this stuff, but I'm sure I'll uh, catch on the more I do it, uh, more practice. Uh, any uh, counselors have any questions? Councilor McGivern. Is, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Just a, kind of a basic question, because I'm not much better than, than the chairman is here, but <laughs> the the Google Drive link, do you have to send it to us every time or do we just keep the same link? Well, you, so you have, so there is, uh, let me kind of backtrack here. So there is a meeting materials link that I've sent to everybody that is the same link all the time. And you can access any of these folders as a counselor if you have that link, you know, any any time you want. When I send out the email with all of the orders and the agenda for a committee meeting, 
Uh, I'm also send you a, sending you a link to a specific meeting. And really that's just more just for your convenience so that you can access the drive folder for that specific meeting. You know, you've got it right in front of you rather than having to go backtrack and find the old link to the entire larger folder. Thank you. Uh, does that answer your question? It, it does, thank you. Any other counselors? Everybody's up to date on Google Drive and pretty much and how we access it. Looks straightforward. Pretty good. Okay. Is that? Sir? It's, it's one of those things where, if, you know, it, things become more comfortable as you become more familiar. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I'll make a motion that item number two is been complied with. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? None. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that uh, brief tutorial on Google Drive. Sure. Uh, sure. Happy to help. I got a motion to take item number three off the table. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, this is from Councilor Anderson Burgos, order that the City Council pass a resolution in support of the Green Act. I think everybody got a copy of uh, the Act itself. Um, and we do have uh, Councilor Anderson Burgos here on Zoom to give us a brief uh, talk on this. Juan, you got the mic. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, so last year in July, uh, Felix Dismo, uh, Simone from Environment Massachusetts had reached out to me. Um, and he, what he was doing, he was leading the, the, the cause for the Green Act to be discussed in all municipalities, especially green um, gateway cities. And I, I recently, because initially he was supposed to show up to the meeting but when i recently reached out i found out that he no longer is working for environment massachusetts so i really wanted him to present this um but i did do a little bit of research and um some of the notes that i've taken away from this um you should have available as you mentioned it was sent to you yes i um, do have something here so, so some of the things that I that I think about um, is the burning oil and gas releases, uh, releases air pollution, which is linked to asthma, heart attack, and other diseases. A growing body of research connects the gas stoves with poor indoor air quality and health problems. Um, of course, we have climate change um, caused by the pollution and from fossil fuels as well. Um, residents face high utility bills. And I mean, who wants to pay for a high utility bill? And in the meantime, your your health is taking a hit, you know? Um, so this is just to basically pass a resolution amongst ourselves and, and to really protect our community. Okay, we do I, we do have the, the Green Act here um, that was sent and it's in, I guess it's at the State House, but I don't, we ha I don't, I think this was in Kipindi last year and it wasn't taken up um, all last year um, and apparently some new people yeah. are on board with this yeah, and want so, to speak on? Yeah, so, so there's no, I haven't been in contact with anyone yet, but okay. um, I did do a little research and uh, as of February 9th, the House had a um, reporting date extended to Monday, May 2nd of this year, uh, pending concurrence. That's That was the last, uh, mm -hmm. at the House, that, that, that's, that's the last thing I read up on it. Okay, because that. And, and there's, there, there's also, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. You know, there, there's also, um, you know, one of the things that it, it highlights is what does the Green Act do? The Green Act will establish a new program, the Gateway Cities Renewable, Efficient, and Electrified Neighborhoods Initiative or Green Initiative to retrofit low and moderate income housing in Gateway Cities. And Holyoke, as we already know, is a Gateway City. So this will actually benefit our, our residents as well as our health. Okay. I, I believe most of us just got this tonight, um, the, uh, the Green Act. Actually, I'm, we might have had it last year, but I'm just uh, sort of looking over this tonight. So, um, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Yeah. Councilor uh, Jordan. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Could we also get an actual copy of the Act itself? Um, we have I here... We have a resolution. Um, we have a advocacy piece on behalf of Environment Massachusetts and Mass Climate Action Network. 
Um, but could we get provided a copy of House Bill 3220 and Senate Bill 2152? So Absolutely. Yeah, so then we can kind of read the language and get into the details of what they're proposing. I can get you that. I can get you that, um, Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Juan. I appreciate that. Of course. My any pleasure. other any other councillors have any questions? Councillor McGivern. If I if I could, Mr. Chair, it, it sounds like you're leaning towards tabling this. I, I'd also like to have a roundtable discussion with uh, people from the gas and electric department on, you know, both uh, you know financial impacts, but on the things that they've been doing and, and their take as to how we can become a better green community, but at the same time I agree. live with yeah. you know the existing structure or what is the existing structure going to look like you know, 10, 20 years from now? Yeah, because the, the, the gas prices are, are rising and uh, we're limited, right? So we have to think outside the box for our safety and just money-wise. Who wants to spend more money, you know? You so it's up to it's up to the chair and, yeah. and the body, whatever the will. The yeah, one more, one more, one uh, more. We have Councilor Bacon. Thank oh, you, sure. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I think we also need the folks from HGE to come in and talk to us about capacity, and talk to us about how we are generating our electricity, and what we can expect in terms of costs in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You heard that, Juan. Um, I think it's, uh, we do have some more discussion to try to get some people in here, um, possibly for the next uh, committee meeting, um, you know, the gas electric, either uh, commission or uh, the manager, and try to get um, those two, if you can get those two bills to us so we can read those, as Councilor Jordan yep. asked. And I'll ask uh, I'll also, I'll Go also ahead. reach out to um, Environment Massachusetts and see if we can get um, one of their employees to come and present and, and if we have any further questions they'll be able to provide that for us. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, that'd be good to have a good discussion on this uh, this item because sure. it's uh, it's important. A motion from anybody at the table? Motion to table. Okay. Yeah, All in favor? Aye. Thank you, Juan. We're going to table that uh, and uh, we'll put that in the committee jacket for another, uh, another reading and next time, okay? Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Item four is uh, from Councilor Maldonado Velez and Anderson Burgos ordered that we create a food economy coalition to identify and propose innovative policies, programming, and or project solutions to improve the Hoyoke food system and food entrepreneurship. Uh, recommendations will be made to align bodies such as Office of Planning and Economic Development, the City Council, and relevant city departments, uh, examples of DPW and the Board of Health, et cetera. Take it off the table for discussion. All in favor? Aye. aye. Okay. Uh, we do have um, both counselors here, and also we have um, Cynthia Espinoza, who was working with this, I think, with OPED uh, previously. Um, if you'd like to come in, Cynthia. I think everybody got a copy of these, uh, of what we we're discussing here on item four. We do have a copy of the, the bylaws, okay. right? so we're sort of sort of getting this, this discussion started on this uh, on this item. So, um, if you want to just give us a uh, a brief take on uh, what we want to be doing here for this uh, this uh, coalition. Yeah, just can you hear me? Just a little bit of background. Um, you got the mic on, right? Yeah. yeah okay. The light on. Okay. <laughs> so this uh, coalition idea came out about um, different research and meetings with stakeholders in the public health field. Um, specifically, uh, OPED has the Mass Emotion Grant in which um, I took on that position as the senior project manager in the past. And part of that was looking at how to sustainably make sure that our residents have access to healthy eating. Um, as you may know and recall, we do have a biking and pedestrian committee in which works closely with DPW, OPED, um, and others um, to sort of move forward active living or ways for folks to be active. However, we don't have um, a body, uh, we used to have it in the past, and by we I meant the city in general of um, when it comes to food related um, programs, policy, and changes. So um, due to the, uh, many of you might know the food, uh, food and fitness uh, 
policy council back in, in the day. <laughs> there used to be a coalition of other agencies, um, but the city was not somewhat involved. This one is sort of making it more of a municipal body in which the city is involved with community members and specifically food, um, food economy entrepreneurs. So we're really looking at f the food system from the seed, from the soil, to the distribution, to the process, to, to the eating of it, and potentially the composting. So sort of closing the loop of making sure that um, our residents have access to healthy food, have access to economic development opportunities around the food systems in all, in all of those aspects, and um, also be able to bring in new economic opportunities. So this coalition um, will sit again in the city with different stakeholders to move programs and policy forward. Okay, I, I was reading the bylaws uh, just the other day that we got uh, this quite a quite a bit of people involved and groups yes. and meetings um, and mm -hmm. I know we had we had talked about that uh, just the other night with uh, Mr. Vega about some of these uh, different uh, the bike pad and the uh, the mass in motion. So now you you're still involved in the the mass in motion grant I, I'm with them. I'm sort of so consulting and helping the city just with this um, this. Um, item and also the the other item of the cultural district and they'll probably come out later on as they were part of the work plan for the grant of mass in motion um, and it should end by this fiscal year okay mm -hmm. and what we're trying to do here is to try to get a group together is that basically what you want to do pretty much yeah group together stakeholders it's really thinking about the sustainability of of work when it comes to healthy eating um, and as many of you know with COVID, we saw an increase of food access need in our community um, so it's like how can we this group continue to to look at certain issues like that but also really bring in the economic development piece and increase revenue for residents for, for the city and other opportunities mm -hmm. okay is that, uh, Councilor Bacon thanks hi hi <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if this group would be taking a look at things like the hydroponics in the warehouses, uh, that was something that really grabbed my attention yeah. when one of the applicants came in about the marijuana, but also talked about growing vegetables throughout the year in that kind of a setting. And so you see that as part of Correct. what you yes. would be doing or, or supporting or whatever. Yeah, either supporting, um Death, all of that, all of that. Um, and there is a study that was done, um, I want to say late uh, 2019 when I came in about control agriculture, environment agriculture. I always forget the acronym, but it is speaking on that piece of how can, you know, potential mills in Holio become um, a hub for a hydroponics or indoor agricultural mm -hmm. companies. Um, so it includes all of that pieces from like literally how do we create seeds or seed packages in Holyoke or not and how do we bring those to all of that so restaurants and, and all that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. thank you you're welcome Councillor uh, Jordan hi thank you let me turn my microphone yes. on uh, Kevin Jordan very nice to meet you, meet you uh, what you're proposing here and what these two uh, counselors have proposed is very important work and I want to thank you for what you're doing one of the things that particularly concerns me um, in the downtown area and in the lower wards of the city actually quite frankly you could uh, you could argue this throughout the entire city is really a food desert if yes. you will and um, it's important for us to continue to cultivate um, throughout the city opportunities to have, um, as is suggested in this legislation about uh, food entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, having healthy food alternatives, having access to uh, mercados that are selling food that is, uh, is healthy, especially to people of lower socioeconomic status. Um, I've also thought from time to time, what can we do in concert with the housing authorities to cultivate maybe some sort of general store? You know, maybe it means giving up one of the apartments or something in the, at Bowdoin Village where I grew up or at Alignment Terrace or these type of places that um, 
would have a place where you could have access to fresh vegetables mm -hmm. and, and have food that is affordable um, or subsidized or um, and, and just this type of um, health coaching that comes that people might not also have access to. So, you know, um, I'm interested in your thoughts about how can, you know, from your observations, what are the different types of things you think we might be able to do to expand access to healthy food um, for everybody in the community? Yeah, those are really great questions and great ideas. I hope public housing or somebody's hearing <laughs> it. Um, I think so, it pretty much putting this information together took about pretty much a year or so. Um, and a lot of the stakeholders included, you know, from the health center to folks that are doing the farmer's market to farmers, new businesses that are coming in that do composting. And a lot of it, um, they came up, we had, do have a list, um, I believe Erin has it, that came up with the idea of programs. And that includes, you know, um, in the past, we helped support the Food and Fitness Policy Council, the, what they call the Healthy Bodegas Project. That Healthy Bodegas got access and funding to have healthy food. Um, I do agree, and I think uh, actually it, during the pandemic, I did see a lot of like actually whole housing be able to offer garden or container gardens for the residents. So there is a lot of efforts in the community by many of our stakeholders, agencies, folks that don't even deal or don't have a mission of food access because of the pandemic. You know, they decided to work on that um, because we all need to eat. We all need food. So. They, there is ideas for programs. Those are more like what you call programs, but then potential ideas for policy. Um, some examples of that included more in the school. So how do we bridge, um, you know, high school to college and entrepreneurship opportunities on that? Um, how can you know policy-wise we can help there? Um, I'm trying to remember other policy ideas, but there were some that were already in the process of thought out. Um, and the goal is once this coalition is established that the group will go back to that board and see, okay, what can we work on or mm. are we missing something? So it's definitely a group that, that is open for feedback, open to, to have others join or attend meetings and see where, you know, what, where to go next. That's great. And, um, you know, I've, I've thought of, you know, how can we use the community rooms in, in our, um, even at our senior high rise buildings, um, you know, sort of have a mini or traveling um, farmers market, if you will, where, mm -hmm. you know, people have an opportunity to, to have access to fruits and vegetables and things at affordable prices. Um, because I think there's a lot of people that are picking between nutritious food and medications, especially among our seniors um, and, and folks. You know, I think we also need to think about, and you have probably more power and say over a lot of this than I do, but I would say, you know, if we can do things like encourage um, our farmer's market, why can't that be in the Sullivan School parking lot once a year? you know, as opposed to always just being downtown, yeah. you know, so people who might not have access to transportation that can't always come downtown yeah. from a Jarvis Heights or a Bowdoin Village, or, you know, maybe it's done at Dunahue School, so Tokeniki or different, you know, places around um, could have access if they would even consider that. Um, so you, you have a very powerful voice to, to really um, carry this message about how do we uh, expand nutrition and, and, and access um, and certainly whatever we can do to encourage this or to incentivize businesses in the downtown and throughout the city to come here. It's really a very important issue because as you well know, you know, lack of access to nutritious food leads to higher obesity all the way down, um, dental issues, general health issues, um, all the way around and um, I get really concerned especially with inflation and the cost of things people are not like the first thing you, you say is well I could buy this box of instant potatoes versus buying a ten dollar it's insane the price uh, I, I bought a bag uh, an eight uh, an eight pound bag of oranges the other day it was like ten dollars and fifty cents you know and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money. Where something like this used to be like six dollars yep. is now ten fifty, and it, you're just seeing it everywhere. And um, 
Um, I, I'm very sensitive to the issue, as I know the other people in the room are, and, and I thank you for your good work uh, in this area. It's, it's really important to our community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I would say, um, why not have more than one farmer's market, right? If we do have one downtown, maybe at other schools and things like that. So I think the coalition would ask those questions and figure out, okay, what are ways, what are potential funding sources, what is needed for that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I just want to add that uh, Councillor Jenny Rivera from uh, Ward 1 is, uh, is on our Zoom now. Uh, any uh, questions from any committee members? Sure. Councillor Puello. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Cynthia, for your work on this. I think this is really cool. And thanks for my colleagues on the council for bringing this forward. I really like Section 3 of this, the, the membership makeup of it, how we're bringing in somebody from the Board of Health, the op-ed, food justice, the schools, uh, restaurants, supermarkets. This is great having all these people in the room to talk about this. And one thing that comes to mind to me is the, the food distribution site that we used to have done in Ward 2. So I hope at the one point we can start talking about ways maybe to bring that back. Yes. Because I know that's really needed, especially down there in that community. Mm -hmm. uh, my question would be, do you know if we're going to be eligible for any grants for setting this up? So we, uh, yes. And cool. we act, before I left, we did apply for the next round of the Mass in Motion grant. Um, and part of that was to set aside, um, if awarded, you know, let's throw it in the universe, how they say, right? Mm -hmm. If awarded, um, the coalition could have up to 20000 a year for implementation. So that could be whatever the coalition decides, whether it's policy related or program related or both. So the coalition would kind of move that money around and track it? Yeah, I guess, yes with OPED, so that will be really working with them. Oh, so it'd be OPED, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. OPED, I guess, getting advice from them and then deciding where it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the makeup of the membership, really, it took a while, right, I would say. <laughs> um, part of it, you know, we were trying to look at the other, all the different food system areas, so like from farming to um, people that, you know, kind of manufacture it or produce or things like that. Um, to retailers, um, restaurants, to com composting companies. So you just like trying to look at all the whole system and how we can cover it. Um, so so we tried our best to do that <laughs> um, and make sure that we also have room for community members who might be passionate about cool. this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Bacon? I must say, it was Councilor McGivern okay. I was trying to. Okay, Councilor <laughs> McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cynthia, I don't think I could add much to this conversation as far as the importance of a coalition, the importance of all the issues that we've discussed here this evening. Like Councilor Bacon, I, I was amazed when the Cubic opened and the HCC Culinary Arts Program moved there. And a good friend of mine who was managing Ara the uh, food services at Community College told me what those trailers are outside. It's just incredible what you can do. And that's an innovative idea or, or way of what of way things are changing. and. And I agree with you. We need more than one farmer's market because yes. they, yeah. they are wonderful. My, my only thoughts and questions are so that I understand this because it's very clearly outlined and the membership makes a lot of sense. Um, the, is, are you asking or is it, are we being asked to set up the coalition as part of the city or just to endorse it and to work with the coalition? So we'll be uh, to set it up in the city. Um, sort of being like similar to like the other committees like the biking and pedestrian committee that gives advice and advices the city council and DPW for like um, biking and pedestrian needs. So this will be a, they did the a stakeholders that is called a coalition, you know, we try to make it as community um, informed as possible. So they went with coalition. <laughs> um, we tried the committee and the other terms. Um, so it will be to sort of set it as a, as a body within um, the city. And your thoughts or anybody's sure. thoughts, are, are we looking at an appointing authority? I, I mean, I, I don't think necessarily the city council should be the appointing authority. Or maybe no, it, it will be by the mayor. By the mayor. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So we're, we're kind of endorsing this and, and trying to work with Mayor Garcia to set up the coalition? Correct. Okay. I mean, it makes sense. I, I just wanted, and then he can decide. Maybe there's a, a department that can adapt the coalition and provide some support to it, some administrative support to it. Yeah, we were looking at OPED. So part of it is too is more of the sustainability. So many stakeholders um, outside of the city have tried it, and because of their short capacity, um, it was hard to continue it. So 
the it has worked in other municipalities as well throughout the, throughout the state uh, and even actually um, in New England. So an example, Hartford has a a similar uh, body that they continue on and they work with stakeholders like aid nonprofits, um, groups, etc., and they continue on similar work. So there is um, a success rate of it being uh, within the city because now you have more sustainability, more capacity, um, and more leeway in there. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Chardigan makes makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I would uh, you know suggest I'm not sure all the committee is leaning towards this, but that we somehow endorse it and somehow get it to the mayor. We would need the mayor, you know, not approval, but the mayor's endorsement to set it up. And of course, to uh, to assign it, you know, to OPED or to to whatever makes what's ever appropriate in terms of uh, of, uh, of of overseeing the administrative part of it. And Cynthia makes a good point, you know. And and thank Councillor Anderson Burgos for bringing this forward because it's such an important issue. And if the city could help coordinate it, it would be uh, benefits to everybody. Any other uh, comments? In the I had one. Oh. Uh, wait, uh, no, another, hold on a second. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, mine's real quick. Okay. Just another friendly suggestion is on the final uh, regulations that we're being asked, should we, there's a number of departments that are mentioned, the mayor is mentioned. We should probably get some sort of written comment from them if they're on board with the way this, all this language is and give us that feedback just in case there has to be any tweaks from the mayor or one of the departments that are mentioned. Uh, um, just to make sure everybody's on board with the with the line with the final language. I agree. Thank you, Councilor Barley. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, uh, did did you put this together the bylaws or was this? Was I this? so it so I worked with um, what they call TA provider, technical assistance provider from the state, uh, specifically the public health department. Just just so, so, so yeah, again, but uh, just Sorry. a touch slower. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah. I can I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> it's been a long day, right? So I worked um, yes and no. In one part, I did get a, a lot of assistance from professionals in, in the field of public health through the state, um, specifically the public health department. Um, they might be actually joining through Zoom as well. Uh, again, I'm not sure if they're there. Um, but this has been actually, they did a lot of research um, of different, what they call food policy councils, food policy councils, and what are templates for bylaws and documents. So, Okay, uh, well, uh, uh, there's, uh, I'm just trying to gather how this came together. Yeah. Uh, you know, frankly, I, I, think, I think we can support something here, but I, I don't, I mean, I look at this order, and the order says that we create a coalition, we meeting, I assume, the city of Holyoke or the city council. And I don't think that's, in fact, what you're, you're asking for. So, uh, and then I see on here, under membership, two seats shall be reserved for residents of the city of Holyoke. I mean, I'm, I'm not understanding why there would only be two. Why wouldn't it, why wouldn't it be just all seats? But, but that, that's, you know, you can devise a committee any way you want. Uh, you're not asking us to put this in ordinance. It sounds like the makers of the order are just put this forward to us, possibly at your, at your bequest, to bring it to our attention, which was great. Mm -hmm. But I would feel comfortable having an, making a motion to refer this back to city council with a re recommendation to the mayor, to the mayor to set up a committee somewhat similar to what he's doing with other areas of of, of interest in the city, for example, the infrastructure and economic development. Yep. And so that's what I would be familiar with. And then what I would say is, if you would, just bear yeah, with me, because you're, again, you're not asking us to, to create a city council body. You're not asking us mm -hmm. to put this in ordinance. Mm -hmm. That the makers of the order, even though they wrote we on here, mm -hmm. is clearly not written that we, the city council, are to create anything. This is an idea that you're bringing forth and you're bringing it to our attention. I think it's a fine idea. I just think it's better off not just being yeah. people that the, the mayor wants, because mainly mayoral appoint departments anyhow, mm -hmm. finding people. And then I think once the thing gets up and running, similar to what we've done in, in, other, in other ad hoc committees, which these other ones are created are basically ad hoc mm -hmm. committees, they're not ordained, mm -hmm. uh, they're, not, um, they're not created by city council like we did with um, the Whiting Street Reservoir Committee. We, we, are, we ordained that, so the, they're gonna come back to us with a, 
uh, with uh, recommendations and their thoughts about what the city could do with the Whiting Street Reservoir. But what you could do with this, once this ad hoc committee is up and running, and I think we're all interested, because you, you heard from everybody, yeah. basically they're interested, and I am too, mm -hmm. even though I didn't, I just, I was re re reviewing it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna jump up and wave my arms, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the first swing, okay? So that's just not how I work. Well, but, but what I would suggest is once it gets up and running, mm -hmm. uh, that you send a communication to the clerk to file something for city council so that we could have uh, the chairperson come to us and tell us more about what's happening. And then we could have a dialogue about your goals that, that you've set and how far you've gone along in, in achieving them. So w would you be comfortable if, if I made that kind of kind of a motion? Because I don't think you're asking us to do something. Would you, so if I made the motion that, that we refer this back to city council um, to ultimately refer to the mayor to, and, and request that the mayor set up a committee to this effect, but would you be comfortable with that? I, I, I wanna say yes and no. The reason, I understand the yes, the no is, and, and it could be a question. So we follow sort of similar steps what, for the biking and pedestrian committee, how it got um, put together, and it was through an ordinance. So, so we were sort of following that piece, from my understanding. That was back in 2016. Well, well yeah. now if that's yeah. the yeah. case, yes. It, so, it, so that's why uh, we we're happy to answer questions, but I, that's how we well, were trying to present it. Yeah. Well, fine. Then yeah. we're then we're in the wrong committee. It's not, yeah, okay. So, so yeah. but what I would ask you and the yes. makers of the order to possibly think this out a little bit more. To, to make sure that that is in fact what you want, because I, I would want to see what the because uh, I was involved with the setting up the committee for the yeah. for the bike pad and all the yeah. rest of that, and that's all well and good, um, but does it necessarily have to go into? I mean, you know, wh why not just get the thing up and running as an ad hoc, and then see how it goes, and then if it th if the mayor thinks if the mayor thinks it makes sense, after a year, which is not a lot of lead time, but after a year, you'll have a track record. And then if the mayor, th this is gonna go forward for, a, I think this is gonna go forward, the mayor might say, for the foreseeable future. I'd like to f have an order filed mm -hmm. to have this be ordained as, a, as an official uh, wing yeah. of the um, open. Board of Health. Open. Yeah. Or open. Board of Health yeah. open. Because you weren't open, but it, it may be yeah. better suited for Board of Health. Yeah, and I think that's why both were there. I would say um, the recent, I think we already have somewhat of that ad hoc committee with the stakeholders. The reason we're pushing it to be like, I guess official, and I apologize for the language. is It's also due to to the grant, um, you know, work plan. It's something that we mentioned, and they want to see sort of a policy change and something that is sustainable. So we're following that that ask from the state, from um, the state. in so order to to make that grant. happen. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. is there something from the Commonwealth that says that? So it's the department, yeah, Department of Public Health, the Mass Emotion Grant that the city does have. Um, they want to see a sustainability piece. So in that grant, the Mass Emotion Grant, yes. it says we want the municipality receiving the grant to set up a committee established by ordinance. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's how, yeah, that's how um, the bike pad committee came bike about pad, because yeah. of that grant in the past. Okay. Okay. Then what I would, then I'll, I'll make a motion, I, I'm going to, I'm going to send this back to I'm make a motion to send it back to city council and then at city council because I think we should have a quick discussion sure. there with with this because I want I want the I want the president to be I don't want to send this to ordinance now because sure. it's going to be something ordinance of the president city council should really be aware of what's happening sure. here so I want to, I'm going to make a motion to send it back to city council as complied with mm -hmm. And then at that point, we could either refer it to ordinance, okay. or maybe at a subsequent meeting, uh, the makers of the order could could you know re reword the language okay. uh, to send it to ordinance uh, based upon what you just said. Because we, yeah. you know, this is it's it's confusing the way it's written, mm -hmm. but but now that you've explained it, that it's yeah. really pursuant to to verbiage and mass emotion, yes. then, then yeah. perhaps we could we could have you know we'd have a little more of a foundation on which sure. to understand this. Yeah. Can I do that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> can, can we? Okay. Just a couple more comments, right. Councilor Puello. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just I'm just trying to understand the grant piece of it. So this is to keep the mass motion grant, or is it a separate grant it's, that we would it's, get? It's to meet the requirements, requirements that we have for the contract right now in this fiscal year. For mass motion. Yes. If we didn't have this, would the mass motion grant go away? Yes, the city okay. will have to. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because in another committee, I thought we voted to move money around because we were told that committee was going away. But if this is here, then this stays, right? 
Say that again. If, if we I got set a this committee lost. up, the mass motion grant stays. So we, I think it was forty thousand. The mass motion grant. So currently, the the current contract is forty thousand a fiscal year. Yeah. Um, that that contract is is ending this fiscal year. However, uh, as the city, we did apply for the next ten year contract that they have. Um, that we, sh I think, Aaron should find out um, sometime this month or early in April. Okay. So cool. it could, if if it gets established and the city that gets the grant, which we're hoping to, yeah. uh, we do, um, I think there's a high chance. Um, then there'll be more funding, you know, to support that work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate it. I also I just want to hear since we do have um, we had one counselor that was here with the the order. Um, he's not here right now on the Zoom, uh, Jose Maldonado. But we do have Juan Anderson Burgos, who was also here. If you'd like to speak up on this, Juan. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for all um, all the input. Um, uh, basically, Cynthia did touch up on everything that that we had discussed, certainly, and uh, the necessity um, for this to go through. Uh, this pandemic has really showed us um, how vulnerable as a community we can be around food insecurity. Um, so this is great, and I thank you for all your comments, and I'm looking forward to see this through. Okay, uh, Cynthia, as Councilor Bartley had said, is that you okay with that to send this back yeah. to the full council and possibly set it up to ordinance and have have the councilors look at it again and see if we can uh, move this along so we don't lose out on any uh, any of the mass and motion grants? Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, oh, hold on, one one more comment, Councilor Bacon. Yes, um, I just wanted to comment that if you do need an ordinance to establish the committee. The order can be as simple as to refer it to ordinance to establish an ordinance and name the committee and okay. and provide the language. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, it, it, don't make it too simple. Uh, you, you know, just, just try, try, try. <laughs> right. no, so make I, it easy. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't want one line in there because this no. is a, a touch, it's a, it's, it's a touch convoluted. So I, to, yeah. add some detail. I don't, I don't need to have a, but you know, I, I don't need to have a ten-page document. You know, him no, um, but I, but I, 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 you know, I could have, you know, something that lays out the, the pinpoint yeah. site within the mass motion grant that that, yes. that that requires this. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion. Uh, uh, Councilor Vacant, have one more statement. Yes, I just wanted to clarify that what I meant by language was the language that would describe yes. why we're setting it up, and then what the details of the committee would be. From I didn't mean to make it. No, I understand. From my understanding, Thanks. we did draft um, sort of similar language for an ordinance, um, and I'll make sure that the counselors who did propose it get it again um, to make sure that you all have it as well. Why don't you just have them file an order for the next meeting for the right. new ordinance, and we'll we'll uh, okay. we'll, we'll have this complied with, complied with, and then we'll have a new order. Okay, and make Thanks. it okay. Motion comply with. I'll no second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, motion. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. If we could take uh, five and six, because they're both motion the same. Motion take up five and six. Second. And the rules, okay. Uh, item number five, and, and I just wanted to make a statement that um, there is a, a Scribner's error here. Um, so it instead of uh, Robert Gentile, it should be Robert Griffin and the first one. Okay, um, just let everybody know. to amend to amend? Bob Griffin. Okay. Item five is uh, from Mayor Joshua Garcia, letter appointing Mr. Marcos Marrero, 34 Pinehurst Road, to serve as commissioner of the gas and electric for the city of Holyoke. Mr. Marrero will replace Robert Griffin, whose term expired on July 1st, 2020. Mr. Marrero will serve a, um, I believe it's a three, no, six year term, but the said term will expire on Ju July 1st, 2026. Uh, item six is uh, from Alex, B. Morse, letter appointing Mr. Marcos Morrell, 34 Pinehurst Road, to serve as commissioner of the Gas and Electric for the City of Holyoke. Mr. Morrell replaced Robert Griffin, whose term expired July 1st, 2020. Mr. Morrell will serve a six-year term, and said term will expire July 1st, 2026. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, I'm going to make a motion to give leave to withdraw at item six. Okay, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item six is leave to withdraw. Okay, back to item five. Uh, Mr. Morrell? Come on in. Leave to withdraw. <laughs> I do it every time. Thank you for coming down, and um, it's been a while since we've done this, an appointment to the G&E Commission. So uh, um, 
ask you to make a statement. Um, we're going to have some questions for you, and uh, sure. we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening. Thanks. Great to be back in the in the halls. It's been a little bit over a year since uh, I'm no longer an employee for the city, so a little bit uh, surreal. Uh, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. We've worked together for almost nine years, um, and 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 one new face that I uh, was <laughs> just just meeting. Um, while I no longer work for the city, uh, I'm still very much a part of of this community. I've lived here since 2012 when I started my work here. Um, during that time, I bought my first home here, uh, grown my family with my wife, Wanda. We had our, our two boys, Andres and Alejandro, uh, sold our first home and got another home with a yard so that they could run around and, and climb stuff. Um, and now have one of, one of my boys in public school. Hopefully the second one will join him in the fall. Juan and I are committed to being part of this community for the long term, and as such, I felt that it's uh, important to remain acti active in local uh, self-governance where we can come together as neighbors to solve some of the most pressing problems we have and frankly, some of them that are routine and, and mundane, right? Uh, after resigning my post in 2020, I submitted my, my interest to the mayor to join um, the, the Holyoke Gas and Electric Commission because I've had a long-standing interest in the energy realm since my early professional days in Puerto Rico where I grew up. I believe my experiences can add valuable perspective to the commission and the agency. I'm grateful to both Mayor Morse uh, then and Mayor Garcia now for the confidence deposited in me to serve in this role. As I mentioned in my cover letter, I've had several experiences in the energy and uh, infrastructure realm um, throughout my career, uh, working in the governor's office of Puerto Rico, uh, working on, on some energy policy issues there. Uh, in the New York City Economic uh, Development Corporation at the um, Energy Policy Office, uh, the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, as a regional planner there, um, and of course, uh, heading up the Office of Planning and Economic Development here. Currently, I'm uh, serving um, uh, as Executive Vice President uh, for Community Development at Mass Development, which is mm -hmm. the state's development and financing agency. I'm also a volunteer on two other boards, uh, Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, which is a theater company in, in New York City, uh, rooted in Puerto Rican and Latinx uh, plays uh, and culture, uh, and e for all or Entrepreneurship for All, an organization that promotes entrepreneurship by helping small businesses and startups in cities uh, similar to Holyoke across Massachusetts and now expanding nationwide. Uh, both as board member and and as staff or my perspective about um, the role of board members has, has been pretty consistent throughout my career. Board members oversee the adherence of, uh, the adherence to the organization's mission and establishes broad policy with the executive leadership in charge of managing the, the agency and implementation. In terms of HGE &E in particular, uh, I see it as one of the greatest assets that we have in our city. It's run by some of the most talented individuals here, particularly Jim Lavelle and his team. I've always enjoyed creative problem solving with him. Uh, I've worked on some of the biggest projects that I worked on was with Jeannie and Jim in particular, and it's always been a joy to, to work with him. Uh, the performance of our electric grid is world class. Um, I've only been at here for, for a portion of that, but I've, I've seen bad weather events that have affected our region severely, and, and yet here we, we do very well, and we've even uh, outperformed other utilities in regional blackouts. Our electric portfolio is the Envy across New England, with over 70% of our portfolio coming from renewable uh, and, and non-carbon emit emitting sources, well ahead of, of state targets for 2050. It also has a strong broadband uh, uh, backbone and team that, that started um, the telecom business from scratch and continues to grow it. All very exciting things. There are also looming challenges for hg and &E, as we all know, um, and there are challenges for all energy or telecom utilities. The natural, the natural gas constraints in the winter months, which has required uh, the need for a moratorium of certain, uh, certain natural gas hookups, new hookups that can have a negative impact on residents and new development or redevelopment opportunities. The progression of human-induced climate change and the measures, requ measures required by all of us 
um, to, to help mitigate uh, the worst impacts of climate change. And an ever more interconnected society, which requires more and faster internet, internet connections for everything from education, entertainment, and work. Recent events like the pandemic uh, that gives us these uh, great pieces of glass uh, and, and recent wars have created additional pressure for us to meet these challenges. Adding my perspective and life experiences to the rest of the commission and utility team would be a wonderful privilege. Solving these problems well will require attention to being effective today and in the long term, providing equitable solutions for all members of our community and mining, of course, the cost burden to the agency and the ratepayers that pay into the agency. I'm excited for the opportunity and thank you all for having me here today. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, questions from the committee? Yeah. Uh, Council Puello. Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Marcos, uh, for coming down and for, you know, for putting your name in, for being considered in the mayor for tapping you. Um, I, I appreciate you meeting with me. I know you had a meeting with me. I didn't know you very well, and uh, we had a pretty good discussion, and we talked about all sorts of stuff, uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, my questions for me are concerned around the gas moratorium. We know it's a really sensitive topic uh, in the city, and... You know, I, I, I understand that some people say there's not a lot we can do about it. Some people say there is. My question is, would you be committed to, number one, supporting Jim Lavelle? I've talked to him. He's a great guy and, the, and, the, and you know, the GE manager. And without getting into hypotheticals, would you take the actions needed to end the gas moratorium if presented? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I've, I've had a, a longstanding and very good relationship with Jim. I've had a, a admiration for him for a long time. Um, I, actually, in one of my first months, I was very impressed with him. And I said, I don't know how this mentorship thing works, but um, can you be my mentor? And he, he helped me kind of learn the ropes in the city and all that kind of stuff. So we have a, we have a great working relationship. Uh, we teamed up on the Parsons paper cleanup. Uh, without hg and &E, we couldn't have done that, uh, putting together the, the funding streams for it. Um, we teamed up on the canal walk. They owned some real estate for that and also on the train station. So nothing but mu much respect for Jim. And, and frankly, part of the reason that I wanted to join the HGE &E was to work in a team environment. I like working with good teams. It just, you know, it makes, it makes life richer. Uh, in terms of the moratoria, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, it's a complicated matter because everyone obviously would, would want to lift it now. The problem is we have a resource constraint. And so how we get over that resource constraint is not going to be easy um, because we can't solely rely on, on new gas, right? Let's put the, the issue into perspective, right? About just over 40% of the gas that we have access to comes from a liquid natural gas facility right now where we pay almost four times more than we pay off of pipeline. And we know because of recent events, and we don't know how long those events will, will last, and of course I'm referring to the current uh, war between Russia and Ukraine uh, and the, and the uh, sanctions, uh, we know that's more expensive now. We don't know how long those sanctions will last. Um, and so getting off of the LNG would help us economically. Um, but we have 40% of the city that doesn't even consume gas, it's consuming oil, right? Which is also subject to additional uh, monetary fluctuations and, and it's not any better uh, environmentally, it's actually worse. So when we think about how we service the entire city, uh, we gotta think about how we, how we do that um, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and meet the needs that everyone has. So, it may require some, some, some additional gas capacity, but there's not enough capacity in our whole region <laughs> to get off of LNG and or get people off of oil, right? So we're gonna have to take a multiple pronged approach. We're gonna have to double down on energy efficiency. The, the, che the cheapest energy there is, is the one you don't have to consume. There's a, there's a much higher payback on energy efficiency than on any form of energy. Um, and uh, we're gonna have to look at electrification as technology improves, right? It's not for everybody, uh, but we're gonna have to target where, uh, what pockets we, we can to increase electrification of heat in particular, uh, so, that we can, so that we can accommodate those needs. So it's not merely, you know, I, I go into all these weeds to say it's a complex issue, 
There are things that we can do in the short term that are in our control, even if we can't immediately hook up to additional resources, right? Any, any infrastructure project, as you know, takes time. Um, the shortest resolution may be two years out. May, it may be a year out, right? And so, but what can we do today? How can we take, take this uh, into our hands? Well, you know, what, what are we doing in terms of energy efficiency? What are we doing with other, uh, with other electrification efforts? The state itself just updated its um, multi-year plan. I don't know if it's a three-year, five-year plan. That's the basis for, for mass save. You know, how do we, how do we compare with that? Um, so that we, we make sure that we're, I don't wanna say competitive, but you know, comparable. So the short answer to your question is yes. I mean, we, we, have to, we have to be able to look at all the options that we have uh, on the table, including uh, potentially adding, adding some capacity. I don't think there's enough capacity in, in all of Western Mass, though, uh, to meet the, the need that we would have to get people off the dirtiest fuels into more predictably cheaper, cheaper energy sources. So we're going to have to look at all of it. Yeah, thanks for that. Yes, I, I really appreciate that. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. And, you know, my, my only disagreement would be is on the electrification piece is the biggest worry who pays for that. You know, do we pass the, the cost of that on to homeowners or, or, you know, people that own these these buildings? As we know, it's wicked expensive. I think I saw a statistic. It was like $40,000 or something to renovate a house to bring it up to, to electrification. But I really appreciate your answer. Thanks for, you know, I really appreciate that. Yes, thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I could get on the list. Okay. Once the committee's done. Yep. Councillor uh, Barley? I'm all set for now. All set? Okay. Yeah. Councillor uh, Councilor Jordan? Oh, great. Hey, uh, Marcos, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I, I also uh, greatly appreciated your work at, at OPED. Um, you know, you were there, I think, eight and a half years. You, uh, you really worked hard. You were very dedicated to the city. Um, I think universally most people find you to be a very smart and thoughtful guy and obviously I think you give a lot of thought and consideration to these important issues um, and I'm going to try and examine and, and plumb into a few of those this evening. Um, this is not an appointment to some whatever board. I think you'll appreciate that there's a lot of sensitivity around this appointment. It's one of the biggest appointments in the city. Um, moreover, in the climate in which we live, it's particularly important because um, there's a great number of concerns that this is going to hit potentially this position could have a lot of ripple effects uh, on people's pocketbooks. Um, you're talking about people's homes. You're talking about their personal finance. You're talking about their lifestyle. They're talking about their future comfortability to live in this community in a home that they thought that they could live in for their throughout their life. It also goes to our property values. Um, if someone was to place upon one of these homes the cost uh, associated, I'm going to go through some numbers this evening on this. Um, what does that do to someone's property values and? Um, and obviously for those that are trying to live in their, their homes, um, we're talking about some serious expense. So the first thing um, I'd like to talk about too is um, the other thing that's puzzling to me has nothing to do with you. First thing I'd like to say is by all indications, Bob Griffin wanted to be reappointed to this position. Um, I'm intrigued by Bob's non-reappointment, which of course has nothing to do with you. You're, you're just the guy going for it. But I think it bears stating that when someone serves on a board with absolute distinction for 20 years, making $4,000 a year, who has done nothing but noble work for the community and wants to be reappointed, why isn't he being reappointed, okay? Because when you're basically working as a more or less free volunteer and this is a guy that the city has invested heavily into through trainings, through uh, hours, countless hours of, of, uh, of knowledge to know the inner workings of the department, um, who has experienced as a retired business person, who has all kinds of experience in workforce development from Hoyo Community College, uh, who really is charged and stays on top of the industry, who has Jim Lavelle's complete confidence 
um, why is this person being removed? So it doesn't make sense. I mean, we are always talking about how we need volunteers to go on these boards, and yet we have the person who's doing a fantastic job. I have yet to hear anybody say anything negative about Bob Griffin, yet he's not being reappointed. So the question is, what's going on here? Like, why is this, why is there a change? Right, it's a logical question to ask. Why are you here? Like, wh what is it that you bring to the table that Bob Griffin isn't bringing to the table? Because Bob's got 20 more years of experience than you have in this position, and by all accounts is doing fantastic and is basically doing it for free. So I think it does raise the specter as a person who's been in this room for quite a number of years that when I see things that make my antennas go up, makes me wonder, is there more afoot here than just a nice guy replacing another nice guy? Because you are a nice guy and you're a smart guy. But Bob's a smart guy too, okay? So the question is, but Bob on, a, on the HDNE is a lot smarter than you are because Bob's been doing it for 20 years and he's been doing it for very well. And, and by the way, there's a very steep learning curve to come into this position. So the question is, why is Bob being removed? I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe Marcos knows if he wants to share, he's welcome to do that, why they felt the need, uh, the former mayor and now the current mayor feel that Bob should go. That inquiring minds would love to know. Well, the first thing I'd like to plumb into is, uh, Marcos, I tend to read things that you say. Uh, I take an interest in comments that you make. Uh, because usually they're very enlightened. And um, I'm going to ask you about a couple of those because they're topical to the subject at hand. Um, first one is relative to a statement that you said um, back in October 2021, which you stated that you didn't feel that in the next four years, that is some point in the mayor's first term, that we would have a an ability to lift the gas moratorium. So that was then, that was October 29th, 2021, you made that statement. And my question is, are you aware of the potential for um, either liquid natural gas opportunities or compressed natural gas? I'd like to understand what you know about those things, what you know about the cities capacities in these areas and do you still stand by the statement that you don't feel we have an opportunity to based on your review an opportunity to end the moratorium in the next four years i uh i believe i know the statement that you're referencing um and it's based on information that i had as as a former employee so specifically about adding new gas capacity through through the pipeline right so the previous scenario of adding decatherms uh, required a series of infrastructure upgrades throughout the region, mm -hmm. um, and those hadn't passed first base. Mm -hmm. um, so it was in that context that I was saying that that's still far away because you know even if that were to to, to happen completely, it, it had to get its first permit, okay. right? Um, the 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 prior company that was trying to do that, Columbia Gas, is no longer in Massachusetts. They had to sell their their assets. So uh, who is it that has it now? Eversource. 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 Um, you know they would have to start from scratch. So that's that's what I mean. That it's you know what else has happened over the year plus that I haven't been here. You know I have I haven't been to any commission meeting. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. I think other than paying taxes is the first time I step in here. <laughs> Understood, but I, I, I am giving some context to the fact that you did make this statement three yep. months ago. So um, are you aware of the city's current use? Obviously, you referenced it in your opening statement about liquid natural gas. Um, would you be supportive if there was an opportunity uh, presented to the city to increase capacity to liquid natural gas? Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't write anything out. I mean, the, so a couple of considerations that that I would have, right? Like, I'm a planner. This will not surprise you. Uh, so when I when I've always looked at things, 
I've always wanted to look at what is the entirety of the actions that we're taking, right? So, you know, not just judging one development project, but what is our overall strategy, mm -hmm. right? And where do we want to go? What's our master plan? What's our urban renewal plan? And then how that fits into that. If we're going to add natural gas as part of a broader strategy, I don't mind that at all. Um, then you have to judge the project itself, right? Like, where are we getting the LNG? What what it costs? What's the long term implication? And and, and what's the fixed cost that we're committing to over time? Mm -hmm. right? Because what I do know is the LNG facility it provides us flexibility, but it, it it also requires staffing and 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 it's a cost for a fuel that, by all indications, from just recent developments, back-breaking developments over the past two weeks is going to go up in cost for the, for the foreseeable future. And I, I'm, I'm, spe I'm specifically indicating uh, Nord Stream 2, that was a big uh, gas pipeline mm -hmm. from Russia into Europe that was going to be supplying uh, a big, big, big proportion of the, of the gas there. And so you know, with, with Germany being cut off of that, now all, all the discussions all of a sudden with infrastructure is, all right, let's make, make two natural gas port facilities and where they're going to be importing them. Right? A, a big part of that is going to come from domestic U.S. exports, Canadian exports, and from other places. So in the world market, we're going to be competing with everyone else for those things. So what's the long-term cost commitment that we're making um, Unfortunately, sometimes there, there aren't good, you know, great outcomes. There are less worse outcomes. So those are the types of, of judgments that I would bring to the table. The first thing I would say is the United States is the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. We have no supply problem. We have an unlimited supply of natural gas here in the United States. The only extent to which we have limitations on our capacity and usage thereof is because of policy decisions that some choose to make to impose these self-limits. So what I get concerned about is that policy goes over the pocketbook of average people. And I wanna make sure that we can trust your judgment that you're gonna look out for the people of this community who live, many of whom paycheck to paycheck, social security check to social security check, that you would not jeopardize their access to natural gas or impose all kinds of these additional costs to serve some other environmental agenda. This, this, that we cannot throw baby out with the bathwater here. And what I wanted to know and understand from you is if the manager was to ever develop a plan in some of these different capacity areas, non-pipeline, like LNG and C, CNG, um, that you would be, if he developed a plan and gave you such a proposal, that you would be supportive of it. Yeah, there, there's, so I think I've, I've already answered that question. That, that No, I, I don't, answer it again, because I didn't hear a yes. I heard. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I'm just saying I, okay. I, I've, I've answered it, and I'll say it again. Oh, good. Yes, I, I, I will not stand in the way of a proposal just because it has increased natural gas. All right. Okay. What I've said in the context that I've said it is my judgment would bring a, a perspective of looking at the entire plan and what it is that we're doing. All right. There are two, there are two important equity considerations that are very close and dear to my heart <laughs> that I would like all of you to understand because it goes to like who, who I am, who, how I was raised. Right. I, I mentioned that I got into the energy realm starting out in Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico pays the highest energy costs anywhere in the U.S. jurisdiction. That's what drew me to it. I started out, my first job out of college was as an economist in the Puerto Rico Industrial Development Corporation, you know, trying to create jobs through manufacturing. And the killer for us was electricity. When I was working in the governor's office, we were paying about 33 cents a kilowatt, which is unheard of. We pay about 11, 12 cents here, right? It's a killer, right? Um, in 2008, when... Uh, oil prices were about where they are now, and it was a real crisis in Puerto Rico. I was working on energy policy. Uh, then President Bush was, he had some sort of big stimulus package that was dependent on um, some sort of tax, you know, big tax credits. Of course, in Puerto Rico, we don't pay federal taxes, we pay payroll tax. So we were able to, to argue that we should have a payroll tax deduction. 
That got the economy of Puerto Rico $1 billion. The increase in the cost of petroleum hit us for $1.2 billion. So here we were spending all this time and energy, like our energy, not like actual, you know, BTUs, um, on, on doing this, and you feel like you're stuck in a rut, right? And so that on one end. On the other, in terms of, of equity and environment, and this is, this is important because it's not, not every environmental argument is equal everywhere. There is an equity argument that I, that I believe, it's the same equity argument, by the way, that is presented by China and India and other developing countries uh, across the world, which is when we as human beings have contaminated, we've, we've filled the sinks, right, which is the air, with whatever pollutant, in this case, you know, if we're talking about climate change, we're talking about CO2. It hasn't been equal, right? The developed countries have done more than, than, under, than less developed countries. The same, can be, the same can be said about Holio, right? The standard at which we hold richer communities like Northampton cannot be the same standard at which we hold communities like Holio. I'll go even further that a lot of the industrial development and production that has occurred in the later part of the 1900s in Holyoke, I said, coming into this job, I saw, I saw a market report that said there was 1.1 jobs in downtown Holyoke for every resident, and yet the unemployment rate was over 10%. What that means is we've been an employment center for people more affluent who live outside of Holyoke. Oh. And so the, the, the benefits and suffering of any policy, needs to, there needs to be equity in that. And so it's very personal to me because I've, I've lived it and I still live it through seeing my family going through, a, through horrible times with the, with the electric grid, through the blackout of 2016, which was the longest one running in the US jurisdiction, to the one in 2017 after Maria, which was, the, it broke the record after the one in 2017, and the horrible service that they get. Every week, they lose power. And so these things are tremendously personal to me, both in cost and what I've dedicated my life in terms of public service, in economic development, but also in environmental terms. We can be environmentally friendly. We can move in a straight line to these goals and yet be equitable in what we want to achieve. And uh, one of the phrases I, I shared with you, Will, I think, uh, that I've, I've taken from my father is dream in a straight line. You may not always get there, but, but walk it. Go there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I hope to bring to this. That's, that's part of my judgment and what I approach how I approach my work here in Holyoke, how I approach my current work, and what I hope to do with the gas electric. So one of the things I want to point out about why it's important to find alternative additional capacity for the department is it is the certainly the short-term solution to ending the gas moratorium. And I hope, and I, I think what I've heard here is a yes, that you will be open to support these initiatives um, as they come because Electrification, um, first, first thing, and I want to talk about something that I heard relative to, to you in the gas and electric department. Um, decommissioning the gas division would cost north of $20 million. Um, electrification of the city to even have that capacity would be north of $100 million um, because we currently in our current grid do not have the capacity in the wires and transformers and whatnot to even support electrification of heat in the city. Our city was never designed for that. It was designed around oil and natural gas. So I don't know where that money would even come from. Then we touch upon the estimated at least $100 million it would take to retrofit the 10,000 businesses and residences of the city that count on natural gas as their heating source. And by the way, we would also have to reach out to our neighbors in Southampton, 2,000 of their homes count on our natural gas as well. So I wanna ask you and take you back to a time um, around 2019 where the mayor at the time, Mayor Morse, it sounded in the impression of some that you had these positions that you have now, which are open to you know, capacity and what I would consider a perfectly reasonable position, what you've articulated. But there was an overture, and your name, and please correct the record if it's not correct, 
But yourself and Mr. Bloomberg had made a proposal to the gas and electric um, and were advocating a name change in the Hoyoke Gas and Electric to the Hoyoke Technology and Electric Department and um, that it was encouraged that the G&E get out of the gas business and go and more focus on the telecom business. Is that accurate? Not, not for me. I don't. I that phrase I haven't heard before. The H T E, H T E. No, never heard that. Not for me. Okay. <laughs> I so, mean, I, I don't know if if Mike mentioned that. I don't know what context. Like, was that an actual request or a joke? I don't know. Um, I don't believe it was a joke. Is okay. the person who is uh, an official? Uh, I have it on a reliable source from the department. Um, was presented to me. People tell me things because I'm here. That's what I. That's what I do here. Um, I look into these things, and they provided me this information. And I said I would ask, so I'm asking. So that is not your opinion. You're not in favor of ending gas service in the city of Hoyoke. That that didn't come from me. Wherever that came from, I I haven't heard it. What what I did in, during the administration around that time with uh, Mike Bloomberg was after the mayor's statement around gas, we were asked to assist the gas and electric in a broader planning effort um, to then if we're not, you know, if, if the mayor wasn't supporting gas, then how are we going to help some of these other transition efforts? And so we, as you know, we would pave, hit the pavement often to get grants and other sorts of things. Um, and we were building a coalition to kind of have like a like an energy plan that would complement what what the HG &E was doing, and I mean those those had a lot of conversations, but not always directly through me. So. Okay, but in your uh, you do not support ending gas service in the city of Hoyoke. We can't, as as you eloquently stated, we can't end the gas service tomorrow. I mean, it's just it's not it's not possible. There, there's there's so much infrastructure tied up. The complexity of this is, and this is why I mentioned dreaming in a straight line. Some technology is just not available for everyone. Councilor Puello just just pointed out to how expensive it is to retrofit certain certain houses. So you so you have to be strategic in how you approach some of these things. You know, some of these conversations that we were having in 2019, for example, where all right, what are the 10 biggest gas users? And it's not about cutting them off of gas. But if you take the biggest gas users that represent a disproportionate amount of the consumption, mm -hmm. and we can pull out, pick a number, 10% efficiency out of those. By the way, the housing authority is, if you take the entire portfolio, it's the second biggest one, right? So can we have targeted approaches that we control short term, because at the end of the day, we don't know whatever stores can do or other utilities. And that can free up some capacity. Right. Because right. why should the small business on Main Street like wait forever for something like the impact of a gas uh, 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 range on climate change is negligible. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not the battle anyone should be dying on. All right. Like that's not that's not the hill. <laughs> um, but there are things that we can do that won't only improve um, our energy prospects. It'll lower the cost for for example, the housing authority, um, or could, I should say, I shouldn't categorically say that because it's not like I've seen their entire inventory. But oftentimes, um, if you consider some of the multifamily inventory that I know exists throughout our, our city, there's been underinvestment in, in the HVAC systems there and it's very inefficient. And, and what ha ends up happening is like the conditions that we, that we encountered in Lyman Terrace years ago you get sick building syndrome, right? So like your heat heats up too much, so the air gets dry, but then when the heat turns off, you get condensate in the walls, and so you get fungus. So people get uh, asthma. So we're talking about like the triple bottom line here, which is incre improving our, our energy status, improving the environment just because you're consuming less, you're freeing, you're freeing up natural gas, but then you're improving people's quality of life, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. We have to be strategic where we go there. It's not like we're gonna be like, all right, everybody, <laughs> by this time next year, you know, just, you can't do it. And then technology changes, you know, certain things become more accessible, better performing, and then, and then you move with the times. 
I agree. Uh, I agree with that position. I would say it's a combination of increased capacity and greater efficiency. To your, to your point, uh, we have a proposal currently underfoot to take Dean Vocational gas service off and to, to do a conversion to a heat pump that would free up some capacity there. So to your point, those initiatives are important. I agree. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you had made um, some opinions relative to the bar grant and admittedly I was not on the council at the time um, relative to that $275,000 grant of which I was told that between $150,000 to $200,000 of that money was to go to an energy transformation plan. Um, now in your opinion, because you were a strong advocate of the city going forward with this bar grant, um, the city is 90% or more carbon free. So in your opinion, why do you feel of all the places that these advocacy groups uh, were so strong to try and start here in Holyoke when there's so many other communities, Gateway and otherwise, that are far less than 90% carbon free? Yeah, I think uh, it's a couple, probably a couple of reasons. Um, one is because that that portfolio is on on the electric side, uh, not on not on the gas side, right? So on the on the on the on the heating side, I should say, um, you know, about forty percent of of buildings heat with oil. Um, I don't know what the rest of the breakdown, but there there's a bulk of it which is which is natural gas, or some small percentage which is which is propane. Mm -hmm. Um, and so all of, all of that is is carbon emitting, and so some of the advocacy groups, um, you know, have a have an equity lens. It's like how do you, how do you transition not in the richest city, but in a in a city that has constraints in a realistic way that's not affecting their pocketbook, right? Because they care exactly about the things that you were talking about in the beginning, um, you know, like neighbor to neighbor in particular, who was who was part of this coalition. They're not advocating for having low low income Latinos in Ward One and Two pay more, right? Like that's not what they're looking for. Mm. Um, and the the situation that we're trying to get over, right, which is the constraint, um, I think they were particularly worried at a solu uh, on a solution that would unlock gas for some of the more wealthier communities, um, like like Northampton and communities farther north. And so I think we, we un, I will use the word, unwittingly became kind of like the centerpiece of a broader issue regionally. Um, and so they, they, they descended here. I will say, you know, there, there were some tense conversations with, with some folks that I, that I had. And I, I brought up the, the equity issue, which was not just equity at pay, but regional equity, right? Like we, we can't be we can't bear the, the, the majority burden for things that we did not create and where we have populations that are, that are lower income. And so I think part of it was them also repositioning themselves to say, how can we help? Um, so yes, I, I was an advocate for that effort because yeah, I'm a planner. So <laughs> I was like, what's, what's our plan? How are we gonna do it? Does everyone know, right? Like it's not, this effort is gargantuan, you're right. And so it can't just be on the shoulders of the Holyoke Gas and Electric. In fact, most utilities aren't great at doing some of the stuff that's going to be required for any type of, of transition, no matter how long it takes, right? So like getting people involved, I mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, multi-tenant buildings and getting some of, the, some of those owners involved, we all know a big part of the problem <laughs> in blight in Holyoke is you have absentee landlords mm -hmm. that invest nothing in these buildings mm. and they're just milking it. Right. They're milking us right. and they're, and, and they're making a killing. And so, you know, the h &E can put as many incentives as it wants out there. If someone doesn't want to be incented, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So how can we get more voices to the table was part of this equation mm -hmm. to put the pressure on their landlords and, you know, I don't want to say shame, but maybe maybe that's part of it, right? It's like, what are you doing for us as part of this community? Because as I said, it's not just the energy impact for a lot of people in their day to day. They're not thinking of, yeah, they're thinking about their pocketbook. They're not thinking about lofty environmental stuff 10 years ago, 20 years ago. No, it doesn't matter how dire it is. 
the thing is, does my kid has a, have asthma? Right. And so these things are are, are, are intricately related, and we were we we're trying to skin the cat through through those approaches. Um, obviously, you know, and I I'm generally sympathetic to um, neighbor to neighbor. I I tend to I mean I go to their events. I know a number of the participants personally. I think they're wonderful people. Um, I don't know, um, obviously there's a local component, but some of these other groups that were funding the bar, they obviously are not from Holyoke. And some of the concerns is that many raised was some of the goals and the tactics. There was one thing there where there was like a takeover of the headquarters for a day um, that kind of shook a lot of people up at the G&E. Um, obviously, if you're in this role, um, you're going to be a steward for the organization. So we would certainly want you to support the organization. There is also concerns with this grant that was creating a effectively what was called a study campaign to go around and educate voters about, you know, various energy components. It sounded like political advocacy to many. I think it I don't think I'm too far afield that that was one of uh, the GNE's concerns about it. And they were, I think there was a number of uh, concerns expressed to me um, that they were concerned about creating a layer of activists between the GE and their own ratepayers. Uh, do, do you have those type of reservations? Because effectively, you know, um, do we want to be paying, bringing in a grant from out of town advocates? to then basically be lobbying against the G&E and um, using those funds for really what is politics. And the G&E really tries to stay out of the, pol the political dimension and stay politically neutral um, when everything is around here politics, as, as you, uh, I'm sure, appreciate. Yeah, no, the... the the intent with that wasn't political mobilization. In fact, the, the bar funding as a philanthropy, it would be illegal for them to use it for, for political purposes. The, the intent behind it was to make a broader coalition and an educated population in order to, to get alignment. So uh, a few examples that come to mind where, where that worked in other projects here in Holyoke that I was involved in, um, we did a master planning effort for Lyman Terrace. Mm -hmm. Right where there was you know neighbor to neighbor, we weren't working directly with neighbor to neighbor, but they were they were doing a certain level of education of of the tenants. Um, we had a master plan that was um, aided by Mass Housing Partnership, and Department of Housing and Community Development, um, and others at the state level, because it was very contentious. Um, you know, people were literally yelling at housing authority leadership, um, and. The challenge was, okay, how do we get together to solve this very complex problem? And I kid you not, like one of my proudest moments ever in my career is when I learned that there was a, uh, there was a demonstration by the members. Of, it was a rally in favor of tax credits. This is the wonkiest thing I've ever heard of. You know, can you imagine like, what do we want tax credits? When do we want them? Allocate them now, but not before closing of the finance. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's such a beautiful moment from the from the yelling at each other to the catharsis of this is the plan we're all following and we understand maybe not all the details of the financing but we understand the steps that we have to walk to to secure financing and get capital improvements that was one of them the other was the closing of the coal plant in in Holyoke or the eventual closing we knew this was coming um I mean we we, everyone, right? Like we knew that the production had gone down. The council had created a committee, I think back in 2011, before my time to start looking at this. Um, and some folks with, um, I forget the groups, I think Toxics Action Center, Neighbor to Neighbor, I think was also somewhat involved. Mm -hmm. And they were coming to the city as well and kind of advocating for certain outcomes. You know, some of them were, which were, I think, loftier than we could get, but they were really like desirable things but we didn't know if we could deliver and so we we got funding uh or yeah commitment for of a hundred thousand dollars i think it was um back when rick sullivan was secretary of ea uh the same rick sullivan was now at the economic development council in western mass um say we need help 
we need an expert. We need a consultant. We need to look at this. What are the real constraints on the site? You know, people people want to use this for jobs of this, renewable energy of that, and can we have a sanctuary of the, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek here, but people want a lot of things. And it's like, well, the site is constrained. It's still contaminated. It, it costs a lot to clean up. It's right next to a river. It's a, you know, it's, it's the floodplain. <laughs> And so is it, let's make a plan. Let's get people involved. Let's make it open, right? Let's have everyone say what it is that they want, what they expect in the site. Let's talk to people like adults. Let's tell them what are the real constraints and why those constraints exist. There's this regulation. Well, why does that regulation exist? Because when the river floods, <laughs> we don't want the water being displaced and flooding, you know, Joe McGivern's house down the river. Joe, I don't know if you live next to the river, but I'm just saying. You were I live there. in the Great Lakes. It's just like the river. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did that, and we came up with a with a with a plan that you know, I don't think anyone starting out would have said that's what we want, but people could respect. And it really allowed for uh, um, what's the company? I'm forgetting. I was going to say EverSource, not EverSource. Um, it was GDF, and GDF turned into something else. NG. It allowed NG to go, you know, they're they're requesting from the state some pretty substantive solar rec subsidies. It was, I guess, kind of in the realm, but like, <laughs> you got to be a really good project. And they could point to, listen, listen, look at the alignment that we have here. The community is squarely behind this. The mayor, you know, community groups, they've mobilized, every, everyone's accepting it. You know, at the state level, I can appreciate a lot more now in my current job. You can't do anything unless you have very strong local support. And so that was that was a proof point, I think, too, to to move forward. And that that allowed the the the, the reuse for the majority of the site that was significantly constrained in terms of for, for more development. Some areas where it had to be uh, cleaned up, some capped off, uh, some have. Um, other environmental constraints, you know, um, endangered animals and stuff like that. And then a, a little piece that could still be used for manufacturing purposes or any sort of, uh, any purpose that's, that's above the floodplain. So those are two examples where in my experience, I thought we could go from, there's been contentiousness on this, uh, maybe unfairly, right? Like the, <laughs> maybe taking over the HG&E wasn't the smartest tactic. Um, <laughs> Uh, but going from there to do something not only that would solve our problem, but that could be a model for Massachusetts and the country. Like that should be the, the level at which we're dreaming. Because again, if you're dreaming a straight line, you may not get there, but you're going to get farther, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you for that. Um, obviously, the g and &E has had some concerns about what would have been the quote unquote energy transformation plan. Again, we here at the city council are very concerned about our constituents. We're very concerned. If I heard one message, one takeaway from this election is end the gas moratorium. I think if we had a public referendum and, you know, I'm itching perhaps to file an order to actually have a non-binding question on the ballot regarding the abolition of the gas moratorium. And um, I'm concerned that this is prelude to ultimately trying to take away my constituents gas service. I want to turn, um, so that, that's the reservation that many had. There, the other concern or the perception on the bar grant was that it was during an election year and that it was the education campaign would have been um, one man's education of another is one person's advocacy. You know, it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, back in October, three months ago, you also made some comments relative to moving people, um, Holyoke homes off of oil service in the city. Can you touch on what the what your proposal is on that, and how do you see getting Holyoke homeowners off of oil service? Um, I think what you're referencing is what I've alluded to in uh, in this conversation. 40% of the buildings in Holyoke are heated with oil. Mm -hmm. um, and so that represents lost market share for the gas and electric, right? Those homes are, and mine is one of them. I mentioned I bought another house, unfortunately, that's on oil. Um, 
those are, are private suppliers, right? The gas electric sees no income from that. So it's a market opportunity for gas electric that if we can target those, um, there may be a subset of that inventory that if primed and we can target, I mean, when you, when you have zero market share, if you can go to 5%, that's all gravy, right? <laughs> um, if, if in part of our planning, we can make headway there, um, we can get them into, into our income stream. And so if we're constrained on the gas in the short term, can we get them directly into electricity? A lot of that, uh, of that 40% is in the more suburban area, I think. It, it's been a while since I've looked at the map, but I think it, it kind of hugs the Main Street area. Uh, not Main Street, I'm sorry, Route 5. Right. So, um, and so, can we, can we, is there a subset of this uh, private infrastructure, right? These buildings that are primed, um, that, we can, that we can be more aggressive with our incentive structure. Does our infrastructure exist in terms of electricity to get them in, onto electrification? Right. Instead of um, focusing uniquely on getting these 40 percent onto gas, because then we're not talking about, you know, the other deal was something like increasing 5000 decatherms of of gas in Holyoke, adding to our 19000 decatherms. But you're talking about adding, you know, another 40 percent of the buildings, the 5000 wouldn't be enough. And mind you, of that 19 that we have, about eight is the LNG facility for a fuel that we know we're already paying almost four times as much, right? So we're trying to solve for a lot of things. <laughs> we're trying to solve for costs now, mm -hmm. but also costs in the future. And when someone makes an investment in a boiler, right? If you change from oil to gas, mm -hmm. you're locking that in for the years to come. So it may be better today, but we may be locking someone in to a worse situation in years five through 15, right? And so I'm not saying it's the same for everybody, but there's an opportunity to look at the situations in which we make everybody better. And for some, where the infrastructure allows and it's lower cost, we may be able to bypass gas all, 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 all directly and go to electrification. And we can then be smarter with our incentive structure that way. So what you're suggesting is that in these limited areas, of course, it's, it's personal choice. You wouldn't attempt to take someone's oil service away, but... You, I don't think we even have that, <laughs> but no, I wouldn't, I'm not okay. suggesting that. Well, I, I, I just want, again, I'm just trying to learn what you're advocating for, because you felt like, you know, we should move folks off of oil. So um, I just want to understand what you're in favor of. And, and what I think I'm hearing you um, is, if we could do limited electrification in certain areas, you would prefer to go that direction than to offer them gas service. What I'm saying is that we have an opportunity that our holistic plan needs to be mindful of because within that, within that population, the people who own those buildings, mm -hmm. we, we're probably primed to be able to get some of that market share. And so how can we adjust the things that we do as a city, as a, as a utility, yep. to be able to take advantage of that, right? And that's part of that holistic planning. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but if, if, a, if an application came from a resident that had oil for gas service, currently I would believe that's probably not going to be allowed. But um, if we could increase capacity and, and attempt to take those folks on as gas, you would at least be open to that. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, the, 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 the moratorium is a capacity constraint. It's Correct. not a, it's not a, a choice because, well, we're just stopping gas. I mean, you, you, you add capacity in order to, to meet those requirements. As I said, like one person's consumption by themselves is, is not the big picture. So I, as a board member, you're you're looking at the big picture. Right. You're not looking at these individual <laughs> these individual ones. It's like so. What's our plan to move in this direction? And so having not just the option of switching to electric, but really knowing where your opportunities are to electrify quicker, is a good thing in my view. But yeah, if someone wants to change the gas, I'm going to change the gas. 
again, electrification, I, I articulated some of the numbers. Um, you know, if people wanted to even convert their home and spend $40,000 or $30,000 to go to an electrification of their home, maybe they're very affluent uh, or they're super conscious beyond their pocketbook, uh, they're welcome to do that with their own money. Um, and then, of course, I don't know what it would even cost to, do, to have a, these electrifications of the grid uh, that we currently do not have. Hopefully, that would not be at the great expense of, of everybody else. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, one of the things of being, and, and, and we all have our political opinions and we're all entitled to those opinions but I did want to touch on one particular political opinion that you had because it relates to somebody who's pretty important to the city of Hoyoke and that's Congressman Neal. Now as you know he happens to be the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee and I do believe the GE works in partnership with the federal government in terms of getting federal funding for various things as does the city of Hoyoke. Back in July of 2020, you made some statements relative to him um, that suggested, and I'm just wondering, do you still feel the same or do you, do you feel like you would rather word this a different way? But you, you were pretty clear about saying that um, Neil's claims of securing and obtaining funds for the district are dishonest. Uh, there's no pot of money uh, that the Neal campaign can point out that they ever directly brought to the district, so they're stretching the truth. Um, do, do you think, as a commissioner, any of those sort of opinions about the congressman would in any way uh, impinge on us soliciting the same very person to bring money to the city or to bring federal funds to the department if our leadership sort of has this view of him as a do-nothing? Yeah, so I would have to look at the context of everything I said from what I think I was, I was saying is an issue that I have with, with legi legislators writ large, which was, and the campaign was heavy on this, was uh, saying for specific projects, money that was brought in, when legislators create programs um, that depending on how they're created, it, it may be like more on the legislator versus on the on the executive, right? Like there, there's a call it whatever build back better or uh, sustainable communities, whatever that gets passed by Congress and Senate, and then it's up to individual um, departments to run a competitive grant process, which folks applying for it, whether it's the private sector or nonprofit or cities and towns. Will will win that award, and so um, yeah, you're right. I, I, in my political opinion, at, at that point in time, I thought it was really heavy-handed, um, and and I, I made that ex that uh, that position known. Okay. Thank you, Marcos, for your time. Uh, we have uh, Councilor Bradley. We have a couple. Did you want to speak? No, you're... no, I'll mm -hmm. wait for anybody. Right. I'd, I'd have a comment. Okay, we have uh, we have one on uh, Zoom, uh, Councilor. Uh, Juan Anderson Burgos. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, I was just reading up on the Baganzi trial. Um, anyways, um, you know, a question was asked earlier, and that question was, why isn't Bob seeking reappointment? And truth to the matter is, Bob is not in front of us, the one that could answer that question. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that he's not being held hostage anywhere, right? Um, someone who's interested in a position or to be part of a chair or whatever, they would be present and in front of us, but Bob is not. We do fortunately have someone who is in front of us, Marcos, who I've worked with and know pretty well. And he is one of the most intelligent people I have ever met in my whole entire life. Marcos uh, is, first of all, thank you um, for for seeking this this uh, this chair. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to process because 
I just spent, I don't know what, half hour listening to someone just digging and bringing up the past on someone who is as wonderful and as talented as Marcos. You know, and I know 100% deep in my soul, I know that Marcos would never put our residents in a predicament where they would lose their homes or they couldn't afford their bills. I know him that well. And this is just, it's crazy. It's just, it's crazy that I sat here and for a half hour and listened, almost like if we're in a trial, like, what is this? We have a Latino, a Latino in front of us to represent. So there's a cultural balance in our city. And I, I, I just assume, and I'm thinking, you know what? I don't think to certain people, we will ever be good enough. No matter how smart we are, no matter what we bring to our table, that the color of our skins and how we think politically will ever be good enough. And this has been demonstrated over and over and over again, even during our last election, when two Latinos that used to work for the school department and now don't, we challenge. And here goes another challenge, and I want people to start listening. I want people to start looking at this certain individual. And if chairman, this Mr. Certain, chairman, I object under point. the rules. This is yet another one. personal yeah. attack of, of racism, of fake racism charges, of insanity. By this fellow member, oh, he needs to stop at every meeting insulting other members of this body. One outrage. You. Okay, you need Kevin. to stop okay, with your you attacks. Know, you need to stop. Okay, you need counselor, to get stop to the tactics. Okay. Everybody's watching, mister. Everybody's yes, they are watching, so stay to the topic. You know what? All right, let's bring up the past. So, Counselor, come on, let's stick to the point here. Counselor. Okay, let me calm down. So you want to bring up the past? People want to bring up the past. All right. So during the debate one time, I was whisp they whispered in my ears. I hope you're not going to start. Let's focus. Spanish. Come on, Juan. Let's focus no, on that. We're, no, we're focusing. We're focusing because we're not supposed to make it about racism. We're not. But yet, I've experienced it myself. Juan, we, we. I've experienced it myself. No, this is not fair. This is not fair. This is a trial in front of us in front of our community. Juan, well, he has every right to ask the questions he asked, okay? I, if you I mean, want to ask some questions. Right, and, I have every, and I have every right to We may not have to agree not with what he asked, but he has every right to ask the questions of the uh, person in front of us. But so, does he have the right to interrupt me while I'm speaking? I wasn't mentioning his name. Were well, you trying to break up you something? You just said my name and called me a racist, among other slurs. I didn't call you a racist, did I? Did I say Kevin is a racist? Let's play back the tape. That's we will play back the tape. Did I say Kevin is a racist? Are there insecurities at play? Can we just right, get yeah. so Let me finish. Okay, let me finish my thought. Okay, uh, come on. Can you just get to the point? Could you ask a question if you have to? I mean, this is the just getting out of hand is, here. Yeah. The point is that Marcos is overqualified, and we are grateful and should be grateful to have him in front of us. Okay. That is my point, that he's overqualified and now he's being held like he's in a trial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bacon is next. And Councillor Gibson. Thanks for having me follow that. Yeah, so, no, no problem. While I appreciate the philosophical discussions that we've had tonight relative to this appointment, I'd just kind of like to reel it into the present time. Um, and I do think understanding people's philosophy and their history informs our current decisions. So I think all of those things are important. So when Mayor Garcia was elected, he generously offered to meet with any number of us. And I imagine most of us sat down with him at that point. And when I met with him, one of the discussions that we had was around appointments because he had very many open positions, boards that didn't have quorums. Um, there were a number of challenges. And in the context of our meeting, 
we discussed that. And I shared with him that my perspective on it was that, hey, if somebody's in the position, they're doing the job, they're doing a good job, then my recommendation would be to reappoint because there was already so many boards and commissions that didn't have a complement of members. And in that meeting, we, it, to my uh, perception, had agreement in that regard. And subsequent to that meeting, every person that was due for reconfirmation, to my recollection, has been reconfirmed on that basis, that they were showing up, doing the job, and that things in general were proceeding. Whether there's full agreement or not, I don't think that was the litmus test. Um, this appointment is the only exception to that that has occurred, to my knowledge, um, since the election of our mayor. And so I think it's fair to raise questions as to why. And I take nothing away from Mr. Marrero. Um, he does acknowledge that he actively sought the seat, which is his right to do. He has also, on more than one occasion, very clearly acknowledged how effective our HG&E is under the leadership that it currently has. So from my perspective, I'm left with the question, well, actually, let me say that my general way of operating is, to use a colloquialism, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, my thing is, I feel that we're sitting here looking at one of the most successful and forward-looking departments in our city, which has been acclaimed in many arenas for um, some of the successes that Marcos reported out. And so that is the frame of reference with which I'm looking at this appointment. Um, having said that, I have a couple of questions uh, for you, Marcos. Um, so you talked to us about how for the last year and a half you've, kind of, you've been away from the city doing your new position. So what have you done since you were nominated by Mayor Morris to keep yourself up to date and informed relative to you know, some of the questions that have come up tonight about the HG&E um, in terms of if you were to be sitting in this seat, um, are you up to speed? I mean, it seems like you've been away and it seems like you don't really know sort of the current events. And so the second part of my question is, since your nomination by Mayor Garcia, have you sat down with Jim Lavelle and gotten up to speed in terms of some of the questions that have been brought up tonight? So if you could. Yeah, um, I met with Jim, uh, what day is today, Wednesday? Last week, uh, we, had a, we had a Zoom conversation. Um, it, obviously an, an initial conversation uh, should I be confirmed uh, there would be a lot of things that I'd have to learn just like you learn in any new job right when I started at mass development uh, there was a lot that I didn't know about the agency and that doesn't you know that doesn't preclude anyone from starting to, to work on something that they've never worked at it um, I think I have a leg up as to any you know anyone else uh, coming in new to the position and that I've worked for a long time with the H&E and I'm confident that within a matter of days I can I can get up to speed on anything that uh, that I would have to get up to speed on right you have to look at whether it's uh, contracts legal documents uh, policies um, you know whatever it is then that's that's what the work in, entails that's mm -hmm. what the, what the work you. requires. Um, my next question is around the whole gas issue and I would like to know and understand specifically what public position you would take relative to being, if you are on the commission, to increasing access to gas in the short term, because we all have been informed that whatever visions and philosophies we hold, it is not real that we are going to go to any one dominant power source anytime soon. So right now we are 
reliant on gas in our community, and it has stifled our economic development, which I know you're well aware of. I mean, even a pizza maker can't expand his oven if he has gas supply, and we've lost businesses from that alone. Um, so one of the problems that we incurred was when our mayor went out so publicly anti-gas, the gas companies that are looking at access and infrastructure go to the communities that welcome them. They don't go to a community to have a fight and a lawsuit to increase their supply. They want to go to a customer who welcomes them. So I'd like to know what you would say in that regard as a sitting commissioner. I, I, I don't agree with the assumption. Uh, there's a lot of groups that are f actively fighting gas expansion in the Springfield and, and Longmeadow area. And, which, and which assumption don't you agree with? I, I, I don't agree with the assumption that gas companies go where they're welcomed. It's, it's an economic calculus as to the market share that they can get, in a, just like any, any other business. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is that there, to provide an example, there's, there's plenty of resistance in other communities uh, against expansion of gas, where despite that, gas companies want to come in and connect. And the, the project for regional expansion of the gas pipeline north of Springfield uh, ultimately was scrapped uh, out of a justification that the numbers actually didn't work, that the, that the utility uh, didn't, did not estimate that they were going to have the types of additional um, customers for gas that would justify the large investment in new infrastructure. So that's, that's the assumption I, I, I don't agree with. And so it's a, it's a, it's a business decision of, of dollars and cents from, from, that, from that standpoint. So from, could you answer my question as to how you would articulate your position as a sitting commissioner relative to increasing our accessibility to gas? I don't want to debate the business aspect or decisions, but you cannot set aside the politics in these matters. I will say that. But I'm interested to know because we know that our local issue is one pipe coming from West Springfield to Holyoke. That's one particular specific issue that we have. I've, right? Most of the conversation tonight has evolved, revolved around this issue, and I, I don't know how it can be more clear. I am not anti-gas. I am a planner, and there are multiple difficulties in getting over a capacity constraint. That's what we have. I understand that people want to turn on the gas literally tomorrow. We do not have the capacity at this moment, to my knowledge, to do that. And so we're going to have to figure out how to take a portfolio approach to getting around the constraint. Some of it is going to be very likely increasing part of that capacity. P part of that is going to be reducing our consumption where it's inefficient so that we can free up some additional capacity to consume. And some of it, it is actually independent of gas in that we have 40% of our city that is not on gas and we may be able to get to be a customer in other ways. Right? There, are, there are things, the, the importance of when I talk about these new technologies isn't because the technology is fit for everyone today. But as I said before, when you buy a boiler, that is a 15-year commitment. And so we're not only talking about what we're doing today that is important and that's something we have to do, but we're also looking at how are we setting up our community for success for 10 years, 15, and 20 years down the line. And so I think we need to have uh, a, a plan that's well understood, not only by the utility. I, I don't doubt that our utility managers are very capable at their work, but at the other sectors in our community that will aid in the very goals that our utility has. Our utility has a goal of reducing gas consumption by 30%. That is a giant number, impressive. I would dare to say industry leading. That is very impressive. Doing the things you have to to get there requires a lot of scale. And I think it's gonna require partnerships in the community as well, not just the utility, right? And also being smart on our plan. If part of that requires us increasing capacity, that's fine with me. I don't know where the sense of that Marcos is here to kill the gas comes from. 
I, I think this is the, uh, I don't, I'm not even going <laughs> to speculate. I've, well, if, uh, I've, I've, wor I've worked in economic development well, for my entire career. Um, and, uh, you know, almost a decade here in Holyoke and the notion that I would secretly come in as part of a cabal to kill the economy in Holyoke to me, I mean, honestly, and I don't, and I don't mean this like personally to everyone, to me is laughable. If, if I may through the chair, I did not ask him that question and I don't know why he's saying that to me. So I, I just I said just, not to you. I'm, I just said you not know, to you. Seriously, I, I didn't ask him that. I asked him. Did he actually answer the question though? <laughs> no. Oh, he didn't answer it? <laughs> because what I'm asking him is specifically as a sitting commissioner who is the public face of the HG&E, where we have this pressing need relative to the gas, I guess what I have heard, but I'm just asking him how he would articulate it to the public, but what I'm hearing is the main thrust is that you would seek to have the current gas users use less so that we could offer to greater number of people. That is the consistent response that I've heard. No. And so what I'm wanting to understand is what the message relative to that to the public would be. Understanding that we are getting calls from people that want to put in a gas stove and can't put in a gas stove. I get the big picture, the philosophical discussion, the worldview, um, which I do not agree with all of those statements that were made. But right now, in the here and now, we have people who are looking to deal with day-to-day -day matters. And that is the commission is, yes, a planning commission, but it's an operating commission. And I'm hearing that you'd have a lot of catch-up to do to sit on the commission, where we have a 20-year experienced person sitting on the commission now that you state has been doing a great job. And so I'm trying to get clarification, answers, and understanding of why you would be a better person on that commission. And um, I take your points on equity. I disagree with certain of the foundational arguments that you make because I think it's about access. And I think we need to provide access to every resident in the city. And relative to equity, everybody needs to have choices. And that's how I view equity. But I also don't, I don't understand the uh, counselor's comment. We should be looking at the qualified people for the positions and if they're doing the job. If there were three Latino members of a commission, I wouldn't want to replace one of them just because they were all Latinos. I mean, my thing is let's keep the people doing the job that have been doing a good job regardless of that type of a consideration. I just think it should be about the person and the credentials, the qualifications, and the ability to hit the ground running. And so those are the reasons for my um, questions. And I do think you're very smart. I think many people can get a job and learn the job and do the job. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But right now, I think we're in a circumstance where we need to have the people that have been doing it keep doing it because they've been doing it very well. Thank you. I just, I just want to make a statement that, that, that there's no position or commission that's a lifetime position. Um, I know Mr. Griffin, and Mr. Griffin's done a great job, but his appointment ended uh, July 1st of 2020. Um, I've been on this board for over 20 years, and I bet you I probably had interviews for probably about six or seven or maybe eight commissioners for the G&E. I mean, some people stay 10 year, uh, 12 years, some people stay 18 years, um, and he's doing a great job. But I don't think, I mean, as Councillor Jourdain said earlier, we're not trying to find out why he's leaving. You know, what did he do wrong? We have somebody in front of us that we're interviewing to feel if this is a good fit, not why Mr. Griffin didn't do a good job or did he do something or is there another ultimate plan underneath this whole interview, but there isn't. And Mr. Chairman, I take your point. However, we never did receive a resignation from this particular member and typically when we have replaced members, they have resigned. That's all I'll say to that. 
but and I appreciate it, your point. And, and this is the mayor's appointment. It's not our appointment. It's our confirmation process. And this is correct, and I have pointed out the deviation from all the other appointments earlier. Thank you. Just, and just for information, too, is when, when this was brought up it, um, from Mayor Morse, it wasn't taken up last year. Came to my committee this year. I asked um, Mayor Garcia if he was still planning on putting Marcos Morero in front of us for the g &E Commission. He said he was going to ask him. He was still interested. He could have put anybody else in here if he wanted to. I'm not following anybody. the process. Yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying that's, that's the process. Um, we have every right to, to question him on his, uh, his past, uh, his uh, intellect, his uh, judgment. But I think um, anything that we do here today is to try to find out, is this individual in front of us qualified to be a commissioner for the g &E? And I think we've asked quite a few questions tonight. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll move on with um, Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Marcos, uh, welcome, and uh, it's good to see you. I, I, not like I haven't seen you over the last year. I know we bumped into each other a number of times, and uh, it's always a pleasure. We've worked on a number of projects Is always together. CBS? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> and we have worked on a number of projects. I have no questions for your credentials. Um, I know what you bring to the table. I saw, I've seen you in action, both for the city and uh, outside the city. Um, I, I do want to make sure we're on the same page in a few areas, which is important to me. First of all, I, I agree with the chairman. Um, you know, there is no question that Bob Griffin is a tremendous commissioner, has done this city service, has done the gas and electric service, um, but this is a mayoral appointment, not a city council appointment. Confirmation of the city council is what we do, and, and therefore we get to ask questions and uh, I don't see it as a trial, but more as making sure we're all on the same page, which is important. You, in, in your opening remarks and throughout the conversation, I think you get the mission of the gas and electric, their own writings, provide competitive rates, innovative, sustainable energy solutions, reliable service. And one thing that we haven't talked about, excellent customer service, which I think is proven over and over, year after year by the gas and electric. They have excellent customer service by all, by all means. Um, the, the three areas I want to talk about, um, not in order of importance maybe, but is we talked a lot about power source, about the energy source, but not once tonight have we talked about hydro or nuclear. Um, we, the gas and electric, are invested in nuclear two plants, I believe, Millstone and Seabrook. We're invested in those plants for life whether we want to get out or not, we're not going to get out. In hydro, not only did we at one, not, not, it seems like it was not too long ago, but it has been, purchased the dam and the hydropower that comes with the dam and, and we produce our own hydroelectricity. We, we are also invested or certainly work with hydro plants as far north as Canada. What, what are your thoughts about these sources of energy and what do they play in the future of the gas and electric in the city? Yeah, I mean, it requires a portfolio approach, including both of those. Um, you know, nuclear, the big constraint is there's not a lot of new nuclear plants that are being built, but to the extent that we can um, buy more nuclear entitlements, which is what we have, that's, that's fine. That's a carbon-free uh, source that tends to be very cheap. Um, the challenge nowadays tends to be a couple of those have closed in our region, so... Um, I, I anticipate it's not a great growth sector just because the infrastructure is not, you know, they're not building new nuclear plants, right? Um, hydro is probably the most promising. Uh, we obviously own um, not just the dam, but, um, but rights on the river and the entire canal. Um, not that it's cheap to make a, a, a turbine on the canal, but there are new technologies also being developed there. Um, some stuff that they call kinetic energy. So it doesn't require you to have uh, a, a tall head to drop water to move a turbine. Uh, it kind of takes advantage of the movement, the currents of the water uh, on the top of the surface. Um, that's, some of the, some, that's some of the discussions I've had in the past with, with Jim Lavelle. In fact, in the Parsons Paper Project, as, as part of that, we, um, we included a, an easement there, a long-term easement, so that we could have another um, throughway from the first to the second level canal because uh, at the time Jim's estimate was that uh, we're maybe seven or eight years out
from having some really interesting kinetic energy uh, technology that could really ramp up our, our use of the, of the canals. Most recently, uh, more closer to the time of my departure, um, I know Jim was, was looking at and he shared with me some other technology that could be used off of the, um, I forget what they call it, but basically the water that comes out off of the, of the, uh, of the dam, you know, that's still water with movement. It has a lot of energy and there, there may be ways of capturing that as well. So there may be, um, there may be an, a big opportunity for growth there in terms of generation. And then, you know, statewide, uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, big, uh, wind energy projects that are happening off, off the Massachusetts coast, um, that, um, I believe, uh, hg &E is looking to buy through MWIC, the, um, the, uh, Municipal Utilities Association buying shares off of that. Um, because obviously there's not, there's not a much, as much wind capacity out here, uh, but but there is in the coast. Unfortunately, they studied Mount Tam and the uh, whether it be the wind currents or the uh, the ability, the capacity <laughs> to uh, to put you know some some yeah the currents aren't great this there. Work. I mean it's you know I mean maybe with better technology we could eke something out. I think the other problem ended up being that it's in the flight path flight path for some of the. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I got COVID. Right. Uh, <laughs> the 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 uh, the planes out of Westover, mm. the Westover, the one Chicopee. Yeah. Marcus, um, I, I think you agree with this, but I, I just want to make sure. We know the gas and electric was established by a special act, and and exists by a special act. But do do you agree that it's owned by the city of Hoyle? Um, I, I guess so. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I've always interpreted it as it's a it's a Holyoke Public Corporation. Yeah. And I'm, I'm asking because there's sometimes been mild discussion debate over this, as what is the gas and electric, what is the Holyoke water power in terms of relation to geriatric authority. You know, was similar in certain debates that that have taken place. But my my belief is, you know, not only was it established by a special act, but we. The city still owns it, and, and that's important to me because I hope you agree that the sale of the gas and electric cannot take place without the mayor, the city council, and the city itself agreeing to it, or the sale of the dam itself cannot take place without those agreements in place. And quite frankly, I think any assets cannot be sold by the gas and electric without coming back to city leadership and and it's sometimes to the uh, vote of the uh, populace itself. You, you want to expand upon your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I didn't know this was a debate um, before. I always envisioned, you know, there's four public corporations in the city, at least in my time, and in, in, in my time, the Geriatric Authority had, had uh, well, during my tenure, it, it, it folded. And uh, what, one of the things that made me proud of the Parsons Paper Project that I would say that I tapped into each of the four public corporations in Holyoke because of the G and E, the Redevelopment Authority, Hedic, and and the Housing Authority were were part of that. So in in my mind, I, I didn't know this was a thing. I, I thought they were all public corporations of of the city. Well, they they are. They each are set up. Language is a little bit different. The Geriatric Authority, you were in the mi in the middle of it, or not as much maybe as we were. But you know, there was a lot as the geriatric authority unfolded that the city wasn't, you know, consulted or wasn't part of decision makings, which, you know, I think created some, uh, some problems, but that, that's, that's here or there as far as this goes. But the, um, the gas and electric is owned by the city. You do agree with that. And, and, you know, barring, I'm, I'm sure some lawyers can say different to what I just said, but, you know, I believe, you know, if, if the city owns something, our charter, mass general law, and everything that's established says you need the approval of the elected body and that sometimes of the populace itself through by vote before you can sell something. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make a grandiose statement on every sale. I know that the, the Housing Authority and the Redevelopment Authority and HEDIC doesn't, doesn't have to get every sale approved. So I... Uh, I know I know where you're getting at, and I think in sentiment the answer is yes. But I also don't want to 
perjure myself here <laughs> and then the, the law says uh, something different. The, the uh, housing authority is... In, in essence, yes. If it, if it wasn't part of the city, yeah. I wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> but it's also, it, it's it's not city-owned. It's under HUD and, and certainly... You know, we get trumped out a lot by what uh, what HUD di dictates and what HUD's, HUD says. HEDIC and the Redevelopment Authority were established by the city for purposes of allowing sales to be made within the guidelines and parameters of how they were established. And each has unique uh, um, abilities within their own bodies, but they are connected back to the city by mayoral appointments and by confirmation of this body itself. And this body itself approves every economic uh, project before HEDIC and approved the urban renewal plan mm. for the redevelopment authority, much larger, you know, it goes case by case with HEDIC, but much larger with the redevelopment authority. Um, I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I'm, I'm yeah, not, I mean, what, what no. and I, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just, I'm trying to avoid to make a, a, a really bad mistake here because I don't, I don't know the details of it. You know, you have my commitment that there are certain assets in the city that not, not all of them are created equal. So if you're talking to me like the dam or a historically important building that the gas and electric might own or a piece of property that may be impactful for a neighborhood, absolutely there has to be some sensitivities to that. And, broader consultation, if not approval, um, I, th I can envision things that no one really cares about. And it's just strictly a matter of like, sometimes you have to buy a transmission line. Um, and as it has happened before, uh, this is a real example, when you're going to get approval by FERC, you have to buy not just your preferred route, but your secondary route. Otherwise, if the public knows that you're going to buy it, then they kind of buy it first and then they run you through the ringer because they know you need it for a power line. <laughs> so um, that's what I'm trying to avoid and being cautious in my response um, so that I don't come off as untruthful. Uh, but yes, you have my commitment. That I, I'm not trying to set you up to be untruthful, nor am I trying to. Oh, it wouldn't be the anything. first time you set me up. No, in no, and, I, and I'll, I'll back you up that you're <laughs> correct. Of course, the gas and electric can buy things <laughs> that they need for the purpose of what you know, what they do, what they produce, and what they they offer in terms of service. Um, the, the one argument that we got into, and and and, and Jim Lavelle, I don't know if he agreed with it, but he did. Uh, you know, I think he did have a different position on it, is when before the gas and electric moved into its current uh, headquarters on Suffolk Street, it was in the former gas and electric building on the corner of Maple and Suffolk. And the sale of that to, I believe it was O'Connell at the time, you know, we argued that needed to be approved by the city because the gas and electric was selling something that they, that they bought, probably built, you know, in terms of because they no longer needed it somewhere to if the school department no longer needs a, a building for school purposes, it turns back over to the city for the city to determine what to do with it. And that, that's, I, I, you're correct. I'm not trying to, I didn't mean to go that deep into a sale of assets. I meant, you know, obvious, not the obvious things, but the, uh, you know, when you're getting rid of something, you know, you know that, that becomes, a, I think, you know, t topic for discussion amongst all the leaders of the city. Um, the last area, you, you said a lot of wonderful things about Jim Lavelle. Um, you know, he, he's a, a part of a, a history of superintendents of the gas and electric that have been the keepers of, the, uh, of, of one of the most important assets that we have because you yourself as an economic uh, planning director um, put the, in, in so much of the marketing that you were responsible for in newsletters that one of the greatest things we have is, is cheap electric rates and, and, a, and a tremendous gas and electric base of customer service and what we do. So I, I, know, you, I know you understand that, and, and that's important. It's important to understand, you know, when the protesters enter the gas and electric building, they entered my, my family's house, and as they st stood there, you know, they disrupted people that were just good people trying to do their jobs. And I, I don't understand that today, and that's nothing to do with your appointment, but that's just, you know, an editorial by myself. But last question, um, and, and I don't think it was your choice, but could you tell me when the coalition between the Bar, the Bar Foundation, Neighbor to Neighbor, and the city was being discussed with Mayor Morse, 
Was Jim Lavelle as manager and designees part of those discussions at all times? Um, he was he was definitely part of the coalition that we were building. I mean, we never we never really started the work because we didn't we didn't get the the grant approved. Um, was he in every meeting? Well, no, not everyone was in every meeting. But uh, yeah, I mean, we wanted to work with Jim Lavelle on this um, and the genie. So we you know part of the conversations involved only GE and not some of the other groups. Uh, one of the things that we were able to advance um, was a partnership with the Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, um, to provide free technical assistance to the GE. Uh, they were doing, uh, I think it was, uh, was it, uh, heat, heat pump analysis uh, for, for the GE, and, they, and they, did, they did complete that. Um, but that wasn't as germane to, to the broader planning effort that we were trying to do because it was an immediate need that the genie had. So, you know, there were, there were conversations happening sometimes in parallel, but we were trying to build together a, a, uh, a holistic plan that we could work on together. But uh, ultimately that did not progress, as you know. Marcus, I thank you for your candor, and I thank you for your answers, not just this evening, but everything you've done for the city. And uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, you know, to uh, debate with you, if nothing else. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor uh, Barley. Yeah, hey, I'm Marcus. Uh, there's, a, there's an old axiom that says uh, where you stand depends upon where you sit. Uh, I think we've got I think we've got multiple examples of that uh, going on tonight. So uh, I'm just going to suggest a couple things. I've I've worked closely with Marcos many many years as a chair of the DGR committee. Uh, highest regard for Marcos and his intellect. Um, I obviously have uh, a lot of respect for his good work that he did <coughs> at uh, uh, in helping us uh, you know try to try to grow some parts of the city and all the rest of that. So Marcos, I appreciate all the all the work you did. Uh, during your during your tenure, um, uh, I, I obviously had uh, uh, visceral disagreements uh, with what happened with the Bar Foundation. Uh, I, I don't believe that any upper management at the GE ever wanted anything to do with the Bar Foundation, but that's that debate's been asked and answered. That was defeated, uh, uh, and that was a vote. Um, so that was that. I, I don't think we need to re revisit that. Um, uh, Marcos, are you a customer of the Genie? Yep, I have electricity. <laughs> you, you are you are a customer, right? Yes. All right, that's 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 great. Um, and so I, I think you know, from my, my limited time here, uh, your your support of uh, of the mission of the Genie is full steam ahead. Is that is that a fair statement? That I've, that I've been supportive of the Genie. That, that you. Would support and in this in your in your role as a as a commissioner, you would support the mission of the genie. I'm sure you've read their annual reports and in preparation for this. I'm, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't understand. Of course, I'd be supportive of the genie. <laughs> it, it's just it's a simple question, Marco. See, yeah, I, I I mean, I, I I guess I could ask you. Uh, you know, I I mean, that's just a simple question. Yeah, you you support the yeah, genie. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's I'm really be volunteering uh, my time. There, there's no there's, well, you're getting paid. You're not you're not volunteering for that, right? So. Uh, there is a stipend for that, so let's all be real about it. Um, and I think it's six thousand a six, year. I think it's six. I yeah. think it's six thousand a year. You are paid for that, so it's it's not a volunteer gig, unless you want to. You know, if you if you don't want the salary, you you can re, I, you, you I, return I, it. I actually may have to. I'm not sure. <laughs> you, you 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 can you can voluntarily return it or, or donate it back to the GNA. They could uh, uh, give it out in grants or whatever they want to do. So, but that's up to you. Uh, I, at this time, uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to certainly want to thank. Uh, and just on the moratorium, I, I, I know we talked a lot about that. I'm not going to ask any questions about it, but I, I'm going to make a statement. It, and it's very, it's very clear that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the moratorium was, was forced upon the department. It wasn't a decision by the commissioners. It was forced upon them. And if you don't want to believe me, you can just read their annual report, and it says it right in the annual report. It was forced upon them. So I, I don't want to hear... The commissioner voted on, or Jim LaBelle, or it, it was forced upon him. Now they don't go into the specifics, but I, I think we could, um, you know, we we can ask our own questions following up. Uh, I really just want to thank, uh, uh, and before I do that, um, I do agree with everybody that this is undoubtedly a mayoral appointment. Uh, I don't want to. I don't. I mean, this is what it is. So I mean, the mayor can appoint whomever he wants for whatever reason he wants. 
on this. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, Mr. Griffin, Bob Griffin, for his, uh, his years of service as a, as a Genie Commissioner. And, uh, I, and I, I'm sure I speak for, for all of us here. Um, I'm sure I do. And uh, uh, certainly it's his, his service to the city and, and, to the, and, to the, and to the utility has been um, uh, exemplary. And uh, you, you can read it in, in all, the, all the meeting minutes that come, before, that come to us from the G&E, they're, they're very detailed and they're very helpful. And, uh, and, and you can see his participation along with Fran Hoy and then uh, the third commissioner, Mr. Sutter. So we'll, we'll, see, how, um, we'll see how that shakes out uh, going forward. Um, so as long as, uh, as, long as I, I, and <laughs> I, I, I will just take one exception of what one thing you said, uh, Marcos, just uh, I think, and I'm not sure if you were meant it, but you said you, you you might you might need a couple of days to get up to speed with the genie. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest it's gonna be it's gonna be a touch longer than a couple of days. I, I I know I I, I know you do, you weren't serious about that, but it'll it'll be it'll be hopefully hopefully we'll hear from you a lot as a commissioner. Hopefully we'll get a lot of feedback from you as as a commissioner. Um, hopefully you'll tell us um, things that are going well and things that are not going well. Uh, whether you say it to us directly or you say it in the meeting minutes of the of the GE I, I certainly want to have uh, uh, your voice uh, heard uh, and and loudly um, I, I think that that's uh, vitally important for for us as uh, city councilors for however long we're here uh, as I said on this in this body I can't count how many times uh, no matter how long we're here we are and no longer somebody was at a commission we are simply stewards that's all we are is stewards we don't we're not, it's not a lifetime deal. We're just here for a finite period of time, whether it's one term or 80 terms or whatever it is. Uh, we're just here for a finite period of time just to do our best for the city as a whole. Not for the whole region, not for America, not for the globe, not for Ukraine, whatever. You know, that's stuff you can do in your own time. But when we're here in these positions, we're here for the city of Holyoke. I know you hear this, and I know you respect that, and I'm positive that that will be your that will be your attitude going forward as, as a GE commissioner. You know, global pandemics, uh, global warming. That's all very important. But if we're going to make a decision, I hope every decision you make is similar to what I make is for the city, not for some larger esoteric mission, um, and that goes back to the, my final thought that was really the reason why I could never support anything that that organization did in its public display of anarchy over at 99 Suffolk Street I couldn't do it I said it to you at the time and I've stuck to my vote and, and I'm glad I'll ultimately that vote carried the day um, so but those are things, those global issues that become um, brought down upon, you know, simple employees of the city, uh, of, the, of, of the utility, uh, that's just, that's, cr that's crossing a bright line that's ridiculous. That's not a protest here. That's storming into a room, knocking on the manager's door and, 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 trying, to, and trying to have your voice heard. I mean, how, how ridiculous. And, and that's, not, that, that's not to say they don't have a right to walk around the street. Or, or carry a sign. That's perfect. That's First Amendment stuff. But storming into a building, they crossed up. They crossed a bright line, and so consequently, I said no uh, to anything because they were going to get $125,000 directly to that organization that I will never support. I don't care who they are and, and other counselors' opinions about that organization. I personally will never support their mission because they were going to get 125 grand from the Bar Foundation directly into their pocket after pulling their act that they did at 99 Suffolk Street. That I can never support, and I said that to you, and I said it to others on this microphone multiple times, but that's the past. We're going to look for it prospectively, okay? So uh, with that being said, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I, feel, I feel like we can make a motion. Yeah, I just, I, I haven't said much today. I'm not no. going to, I'm not going to take a half hour, but. Uh, I hope I took less than five minutes. I think. No, I, um, I do have, and it's, it's been a great meeting, but um, there was, there was one at least thing I brought up I'd be remiss because one of my long-term co-workers had brought this up and he's been fighting for it for years and why other communities have it. What's your thoughts on fiber to the house in our community and how do you feel that we could go about that? That was surprising. No, no questions on that. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we, I think we have a, a, 
a backbone in 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 Holyoke that we we need to examine more. There's a lot more, you know. We have a growing business and a growing operation there, um, but it's it hasn't been the core business of HG&E for a while. And so, um, you know, there was a there was a ballot initiative for that, and I'd be lying if I told you I, I didn't vote for it. Right? Like this is something that as a citizen. I would like to see as an option, as, as, as a commissioner, I think the weight falls on, on us to examine what management is putting together to make sure that it's a viable plan that can sustain itself. It does require, just like all the other things that we've talked about here, broad investment in an area that still has technological change. And you know, what do I mean by that? Um, to give you an example, at the, at the tail end of my tenure, with the city uh, when we, going back to I think March, April of 2020, uh, when the shutdowns happened, we were um, trying to fight to get more internet connectivity for, for the kids in the city because not everyone had, had quality internet for remote learning, right? Um, talk about an equity problem. Um, and we we're trying to work with Comcast to, to, you know, us taking part of the part of the money, I don't remember what, what pot of incentive money it was to, to try to get this done and it was it was pretty hard um, ultimately it did happen but I, I won't go into how hard it was and sometimes unjust and who we had to get involved and in, including our federal delegation by the way um, to make that happen while that was happening we were also in conversations with the g and &E to try to implement other type of kind of cellular type technology it's not quite like that but um, you know, high-speed internet through through towers, right? There's certain uh, bandwidths that have been opened up by the federal government that used to be uh, used by, I think, emergency management personnel that's now commercially available. And so there's other technologies that may, for a fraction of our cost, can get, yes, also a fraction of the impact, but it could be bigger bang for the buck. Um, what is the solution? I honestly don't know. That's why we have experts in the telecom division that are going to be looking at that. Um, I'm going to be bringing the same type of judgment that I've talked about in terms of the gas moratoria or any of the other technologies also to, to telecom. It is, it, it is a need. I don't, I don't think that you'll find many people that will say that Holyoke has quality, broad, internet, fast internet service. Um, you know, Councilman McGivern talked about customer service. You know, <laughs> people love customer service and gas and electric. Not so much for our cable provider, uh, cable internet provider here. Um, and so all those things can, you know, you have to weigh that and have, have a plan on how we're going to, to deploy this. We have areas in our city that are probably uh, primed to be able to get internet first. Um, uh, but if our plan is only doing that, then we'll probably leave an important sector of our community out. And so again, we have to look at what is our broad plan? How are we gonna dream in a straight line? How are we gonna start building this infrastructure? Um, and, and, and having further access. And also, there might be the possibility that we look at the numbers and we say, this is not something that we can do. I mean, there's, there's, there's always the possibility that, that, that you look at that. I mean, those, I don't see this as a, as a, as a political question. Um, there are obviously values that you bring to your judgment, but um, we have to be stewards, as, as Councilor Barley was saying, of, of, uh, of the coffers as well. I appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. As I, it's uh, something that people have been bringing up to me for the past several years that Westfield has it, Chicopee or South Halley has it, and why can't Hoyle get it? So, uh, and I know it's a cost. I think last I talked to somebody, the G&E was a, a $30 million investment, something like that. So I, I know it's something that uh, is... And, and there are, um, there is federal and state money that's coming on live now. It's a problem not just in Holyoke, all throughout the United States. And so there's new money coming in precisely to start you know, these, these networks or build these networks. Uh, some of the communities around us actually connect into our backbone. <laughs> and so there is, g and &E provides some of that service. They rely on us. Um, so I am, I am hopeful that um, with that additional money and good planning, I know that's already underway, uh, we, can, we can start cracking that nut. Thank you for your, your answer on that. You want a motion, Pete? Motion? Oh, hold on. Councilor, Councilor Jordan. Yeah, just in fairness to Bob, Griffin, I did want to point out, Bob wanted to be reappointed. There was some comment about, um, you know, why Bob's not here. Well, he wanted to be reappointed. He just wasn't reappointed. That, in fairness to Bob, 
So, um, and obviously I won't go, I already gave my comment. I thought Bob did a good job. But again, that is no slight on Marcos in any way. Um, but as far as Bob goes, he, he, he wanted to be reappointed and unfortunately it was not. But um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I'll, I'll, make, a, I'll make a motion to, uh, to advance uh, Marcos appointment to the full city council at our next meeting. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We'll forward it to the uh, council next Tuesday Thanks, night. Thanks, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. Thanks, Marcos. Mr. Thank Pre Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to take, uh, as suspend our rules, to take 7 to 25 as a package and to give an abbreviated reading and then ultimately to uh, give them leave to leave draw. To draw. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're going to take these uh, items that uh, we've been in a jacket for a while. To, it's as a uh, clean out, and anything that we do discuss here, if somebody wants to refile, they can refile. Um, just real briefly, I'm just going to get the name and the date and uh, just a brief um, reading of it. Um, Council Roman, uh, Human Resource Department, provide demographics and municipal government and workforce. Uh, Lisi, the council invite the police chief and appropriate mental health officials into form us of best practices. LeBron Martinez, uh, residents of Holyoke City Departments, quality of life issues of renters in the Holyoke Public Library area. Uh, Lisey Anderson Burgos, LeBron Martinez, Valentine, resolution of nuclear disarmament um, and nuclear war. Um, Mayor Morse uh, appointing Carmen Morales and Margaret Lemire in commission. McGee Leahy, or State Rep uh, Vega and Yuma, uh, Senator Hummison request a moratorium on group homes. Uh, McGee Leahy ordered that the law department and commissioner uh, review the MHA project on Yale, 11 Yale Street. Uh, McGee that the city council looking at placing a history marker on Cabot and South Summer Street. Um, LeBron Martinez uh, order a remind council for appointment of youth students on the council. From Mayor Morris appointing Fire Chief Jeff Preskopowski as emergency management director. 17, uh, order of DPW looking at replacing city council desks and chairs. Um, 18, uh, DPW replaced trees surrounding High Street with the use of FlexiPave. Uh, from Lisi, um, council uh, hold a hearing, explore preparation for 2020 elections with COVID pandemic. Uh, 20, Leahy, the city Hoyoke looking to lease or rent mobile trailers for the voting. Uh, 21, Anderson Burgos, Hernandez, Lisi, uh, trustee of the Soldier Home, attend our meeting. Um, 22, the vacant ordered that absentee ballots shall be open in city council chambers with cameras. Uh, vacant, the city clerk register, provide total current and registered voters and steps taken that has been accurate. Uh, 24, McGee ordered the legal department to get an update on the Yosti project and 25, uh, Mayor Joshua Garcia appointing Jennifer Keat, uh, Hoyle Green Development Authority. Take all those and uh, make a motion to uh, leave to withdraw. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. And a motion one more order? To adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn. No one's uh, doubting that one. The second. <laughs> all in favor? All right, Aye. Good job. All right. Good Aye. job, guys. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Have a good night.